If you enjoyed today's video, please consider subscribing to the channel. When you do, make sure you hit the notification bell. That means that you will be informed of when a new video has been released. If you would like to take that support one step further, you can do that via Patreon, which is an optional monthly service you can donate money towards the channel. Or you can go over to Kofi. Dot com and for the price of a coffee you can help donate towards the channel as well links for all of those will be in the description of the video and without further ado enjoy the video ready adam we're live boys happy days let's go Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever you happen to be listening to another episode of the Non-League Nosh. I am James, and as always, I'm joined by my colleague and good friend, Adam. How are you doing this evening, sir? You well? Oh, very good, thank you. Yeah, um, I suppose uh, another day in lockdown done. I'm, I'm, just, I'm saying we're still in lockdown because things haven't really uh, changed too much. But um, yeah, well, done, done a few jobs around the house, sort of. Uh, at the point of recording this, potentially a lot of things have changed because me and you could technically now meet up and have a game of football, but I'm not allowed to go and see my not allowed to go and see my family. So yeah, as long as we don't do one on ones, mate, we're good. <laughs> There's a weird the old, uh, Paul Skulls passing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, get on the wreck and uh, ping fit forty yard passes to each other. Exactly, like fun. practice our diags, we'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, current sign of the times, eh? Absolutely, absolutely madness. A um, couple of bits of housekeeping, though. We have made some investments to the Definitely. podcast, haven't we, today? We've both been chatting a lot today. Um, you've just purchased a new mic. Which, which... I desperately need, because I have got a knockoff Chinese ta headset on that I've been wearing <laughs> since the get-go. <laughs> it, it isn't great, and when I talk, people's volumes go all over the place. So I've invested... Yeah, uh, which I'm quite looking forward to, but I think the mic's a bit of a monster. It look, it looks like a crane. I'm not going to lie; it looks absolutely huge. And uh, I have purchased a new laptop, which is incredible. I've had this laptop since 2011. The poor thing; it takes about three and a half hours to four hours to render a basic podcast. Whereas now, the new one will hopefully do. What did you say, Adam? In about ten minutes, Max. Well, so... I, I I can do like heavy multi-cam videos on my laptop uh in about eight to nine minutes madness so um, i'm gonna go from three and a half hours down to eight minutes james you're gonna be excited in the trouser department i think when things get going <laughs> <I don't know>. <laughs> <laughs> like, like you, you're gonna have so much time spare oh dearie me but now let's move on from housekeeping let's uh invite and talk um to our guests on the show i am absolutely delighted to say that we are joined by ex norwich city orlando city and current sligo rovers captain Kyle Callan McFadden. Sir, how are you doing this evening? You well, mate? I'm good, thanks, lads. How are you? Yeah, not too bad, thank you. Not Pleasure too bad. to have you on. Well, yeah, yeah. You, you say that. I actually have a bit of a bone to pick with you, Kyle. You you right. won't know this, but I, I, on my football manager save this year, have been manager of Bohemians, and I, I tried to sign you, and you rejected me. So uh, <laughs> we're already on a bit of a bad foot here, but... Uh, uh, still. I stay away from them Dublin clubs, you know. I like to stay out, out west here in Sligo. He's <laughs> got some hard coded loyalty into that game. <laughs> Do you know what? It didn't matter how much I offered you, you were just like, no, not interested. No I'm interested. Loyal here. I'm loyal out west. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to get that off my I had to get that off my chest before we uh, before we started this podcast. But no, abs honestly, absolutely um, delighted to have you on. Um, I can't wait to talk about your career in the game and kind of where you're at at the moment and I know a lot of Norwich fans will be listening to this um, myself being a Norwich fan included um, will be very keen to kind of get your thoughts on the early part of your career um, Adam just a bit of a disclaimer is an Ipswich fan we're not going to hold it against him but uh, I don't hold prejudice though against people so don't no. worry <laughs> no, no, we're you're absolutely... we had Dean Bowditch on the other day and I think I coped with that quite well to be honest so I think we're absolutely <laughs> Fine. So uh, you you, you coped well with the fallout of having to have an Ipswich Town logo on your uh, YouTube channel. Oh, I know it. I, I, it, <laughs> it, it, it's, it did not sit well with me for a couple of hours, but I kind of got over it in the end. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. There we go. Um, now, 
Kyle, I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, with the podcast and w- what we do at the beginning to kind of get people warmed up and eased into yeah. it. We have uh, questions, either or questions that we uh, we introduce to people. Adam, you'll be delighted to know I've added a few more into this today. Oh, yes, we needed some change. This <laughs> is fantastic. Got, I've got a bit of variety in there. I've taken a few questions out. I've added a few ones in there. So we're just going to so, I mean, go. I've got some uh, new ones to answer myself. You have. Oh, oh. You have. So, Kyle, let's yeah. kick things off. Chinese yeah. or Indian? Oh, Chinese all day. Good yes, man. Mate. We're already off to a good start. <laughs> Tea or coffee? Coffee. Two for two. That's what I like to hear. Favourite biscuit to dunk? <sighs> Has to be digestive. Oh, that's two nights in a row, James. Really? Just what? Just a plain digestive? Is there any chocolate involved? Just, uh, just I mean, simple... you, know, you know yourself. You've got kids. You've no time to be hoping through the drawers looking for the best biscuit <laughs> <laughs> this is so true uh, yeah, you literally just grab whatever you can find really don't Even you as quick as you can yeah <laughs> it's normally like the soft remnants that have been like, open for way too long as well and uh this is the new one adam i want your i want your answer after carl's given his favorite alcoholic drink now, obviously, um, Kyle, this is for when the season finishes. Of uh, course, yeah, you don't yeah. drink during the season, naturally. Uh, um, a Coors Light. Oh, yeah. A yeah. Coors Light, paint a Coors Light, yeah. I know a lot of people are probably expecting to say Guinness, but nah, Coors Light. <laughs> We're not going to stereotype every Irish <laughs> festival. Uh, don't worry. Well, uh, maybe some of our audience might, but we won't on the podcast. Adam, <laughs> Adam your answer. Yeah, of course, light for me as well. Um, really? I, I suppose really I should turn around and say it's an Aspel cider, shouldn't I, if I go with our local brewery? Well, yeah, um, if, you, if you really want to play down to the Suffolk, uh, uh, Suffolk thinking, yeah. Yeah, but no, like, of course, like, that's that's my beer of choice when I'm out and on a bit of a session. Yeah, I would... Oh, it depends for me. If it's if it's cider, it's probably a Aspel um, Harry Sparrow. Harry Sparrow, that is your drink, James. That is that is my go-to. If it's a beer, I'm actually going to go for a Bud Light. All right. It's just it just kind of gets me, you know, gets me to where I want to be at the end of the day. So uh, on the, the floor. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> it ease, ease me for a football match. Let's put it that way. So back to the questions: Instagram or Twitter? Uh, Twitter at the minute with what's going on, everyone's going mad on there. It's, it's good for football, isn't it? Yeah, there's to be fair, you know, all the chat about the league restarting, etc., and all that, you know, it's quite interesting at the minute. But all or not, there, if it wasn't for what's going on, it'd probably be Instagram. But at the minute, I'm going to go for Twitter. Do you know what? With Instagram at the moment, all I'm seeing is like people's 30 day song challenges on oh. there. I'm not interested. I just skip past it. I think yeah. everyone does, but. Yeah, I'd probably have to say Twitter at the moment as well. At least the uh, Strava screenshots have disappeared. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> like, uh, I expect what we'll be seeing is how far people can throw a hammer in the local park. <laughs> uh, now we can do, you know, javelin toss uh, records. Now we can do better exercises. I don't yeah. know. but uh, Yeah, it's like it, 30, 30 day song challenges or someone going out for a walk. And it's like, really? OK, we're all going out for walks. Do you know yeah. what I mean? So that's not interesting. But I'll put early bets out. Day. Golf pictures are going to dominate, absolutely dominate. Yeah, can I imagine? Everyone is going to be playing golf. Yeah, my my old man's going to yeah he's going to be well on that to be honest. So uh, yeah yeah you're probably right. Uh, favorite type of music? What are you into? Ah, uh, just you know I'm I'm just sort of playing gym, whatever's in the charts I suppose. Right. Um, yeah. yeah, just the old pop, hip hop, you know, classic stuff like that. Nothing yeah. too fancy. <laughs> That's fair enough. Uh, favorite box set. What you? Uh, what have you either been into that's still like your number one go-to, or what are you into at the moment? What are you watching as things stand? Oh, me and the missus, we just finished that um, the Money Heist on Netflix. So so good, isn't it? Yeah, we we got hooked on that to be fair. But there's one annoying thing. It was the way that like they were obviously Spanish, and then there was a voiceover. Yeah, yeah. Like I was saying to someone the other night, I, can't, I think it was Joe Jacobson was watching it. I was saying to him, like, I watched it first time round in Spanish and re- just read all the subtitles. Yeah. Um, that's, that's so good. Yeah, no, it's very good. So, yeah, we just finished that there. We thought that was very good. Um, and then there's this new thing, this new one that was out, uh, I think it got re- released two or three weeks ago, called uh, Normal People. It's an Irish thing. 
Right. right. Because it's been broadcasted in the UK. It's been a bit of a hit in the UK as well. So we just finished that last night as well, when the kids are in bed, obviously. But, um, yeah, that, that's pretty good. So if you haven't watched that, I'd recommend watching that, yeah. Add that to the list, James. The uh, the money heist one, my missus, we sat down the other day when he was having his afternoon nap and she went, do you want to start one of those? And he, he was just been, he'd been such a pain all day with his TV and stuff like that. I was just like, I've got absolutely no energy. I just need to sit here and just like, close my eyes for 10 minutes. So I will get on it because so many people recommended it to me. So, I yeah. Will, yeah. yeah. I that is good, it is. You, you do need to concentrate, though. Like I would yeah, say that's yeah, a disclaimer. Yeah, there is that, so that, much going on. That is my problem, yeah. at the moment. I just can't concentrate. So, it's uh, virtually <laughs> real time, isn't it? At points. Yeah, yeah. Um, epi- like one episode sometimes doesn't actually trans- transcribe too much story. No. Um, just yeah, no. keep your eyes glued to it. To be honest. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say you're not really selling that well for me, Adam. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> well, yeah, that's Captain Basic over there. Yeah. <laughs> Favourite film? Oh, favourite film? Oh, let me see. Oh, I like um, American Sniper. Oh, that's a good film. Yeah, I'm a big fan of that. Or Coach Carter. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Coach Carter's a good film. They're up there, yeah, I'd say. Just yeah. off the top of my head, like. So if yeah. someone has actually come on and named two films that I've actually watched. <laughs> that's that's probably the first time in 22 episodes there you go Connect, connection for you adam there yeah. you go. uh cats or dogs dogs yeah other than football favorite sport um let me see favorite sport uh probably probably i'd say rugby okay. yeah yeah enjoy watching it yeah yeah Especially when the Six Nations is on, that's where I, that's my go-to with rugby. Yeah. Um, FIFA or Football Manager? Football Manager. Good man. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Football Manager. Yeah. Yeah, FIFA can get in the bin as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Unless I'm Football not a massive. I I haven't bought FIFA since probably I don't know maybe 2013. Stuff like that. I just I just haven't bought it in such a long time. It just got so repetitive after all. Yeah. Gave up. I haven't bought it since my kids were born. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's the truth as well. <laughs> I, I, I know your answer, Adam. I'm guessing yours is good. Please say FM. Yeah, it is now, but it probably wouldn't have been a, probably just before we did this podcast. You kind of convinced me to. I said yeah, to you, I, I bought every single one of them and I just kept firing them up and couldn't get into them, so then just didn't play them anymore. Um, and as you know, like I then got into it and my current. I've only been playing it over the last couple of weeks, but my current game time is now approaching 100 hours. Jesus. <laughs> like, I've been absolutely glued to it. Um, so I, I, I don't know, and I can do seasons pretty quick on my laptop as well, so I've been firing through it. Yeah, all like, right, don't brag. No, like, pretty <laughs> rapidly. So, like, the thing is, I'm getting way into the future, and then I'm thinking, oh, I need another challenge. That's my problem. Uh, you see, you need to do a Journeyman series. That's how I got over to Ireland. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's that's the thing I've got. Whereas with FIFA, because I'll get that as well. I mean, I've got a funny story about FIFA. I bought FIFA 20 for my Nintendo Switch, thinking it would have all like the street football on it and stuff. I accidentally bought the Legacy Edition, which is just FIFA 2019 with new players on it. And <laughs> dropped, dropped 25 quid on it, so that was a waste of money. Um, okay. But I can't can't bear doing the the career mode on on that. Like every single time you play a game, it's 10 minutes of your life you just burn. Yeah, it just, just gets a bit repetitive, doesn't it? Uh, Kyle, who do you support? Tottenham Hotspurs. Ooh, how come how come Tottenham? Uh, my dad my dad's a Spurs fan, so um I guess he just kinda of brainwashed watched me bring me up. Um but then all my brothers and uncles and cousins are all Arsenal, so it's a bit it's a bit mad in, in the family. But uh yeah, Spurs fan, yeah. Have you been over to the new ground yet? I actually haven't, no. I haven't, because our se- the way our season runs here, we don't really get much time. But actually, November, last uh, last November there, I went to watch Norwich and Spurs at Carrow Road. Yeah, yeah. I think it was, yeah. was it the one each? Was it one each, or? Yeah, I I think yeah, yeah that's okay. the, I was at that game, yeah. So whenever I get back to Norwich, because the missus is from Norwich, I, um, I always try to catch a game. So, yeah, I got to see them at Carrow Road anyway. Good man. Good man. Favourite player growing up? Roy Keane or Ledley King. Yeah. yeah? Yeah, Roy Keane. I have to say Roy Keane, yeah. He's a bit of a hard man and a bit of another. 
<laughs> Led, Ledley King, oh, what he was an unbelievable talent as it is, but yeah. he didn't have those injuries. He, I honestly think he would have been the best centre back the world's in. Yeah, he, if he, he did have those injuries, because he he had everything. He wasn't just good defensively. He had the pace and the power. Yeah, he was rapid for a big game, he, he was. He was one. He's one of the most unfortunate footballers of our time. Yeah, yeah. like if we, yeah. you reflect on it in that way, if you look at his skill versus the way that his career panned out, yeah, like there's not many people that can compare right. misfortune to him. Yeah, there's yeah. Uh, there's him, Kieran Dyer, Michael Owen. Um, Fabrice Mwamba is another one that you can say had incredible oh, talent yeah, and then yeah, yeah. got it all pulled away from him. There's there's a few, yeah. but. I don't think Dyer would have been comparable to Ledley King, if I'm honest. Oh, no, no. Not, like in not terms of intense, heights but, they could have reached. But he was still a hell of a talent, wasn't he? Oh, definitely. Um, best play you've seen live? Oh, it'd have to be Kaka. Oh, in his prime. What a shout. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Kaka, was... yeah. I've seen him live a few times. He was obviously at Orlando when I was there, so. Oh. Yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. So wow. I've seen him. Trained from a few times, yeah. That must have been un- unreal to like play with somebody with that ability. Like, it was crazy, yeah. yeah. The world was mad. The first few sessions, like, I was starstruck. It's mad though, because not many people would be able to say that the best player they've seen live is someone they've also played with. Yeah, yeah. that's very that, true. That's, yeah. that's a real nice little bit, yeah. No, he, yeah. was, he was he was a joke, yeah. And I remember um, Antonio Noscherino, the guy who played with AC Milan. Yeah. He yeah. signed with Orlando as well that season, and them two together were just an absolute joke in training. <laughs> I mean, you're just running around for no reason, really. You've got no one to get the ball. <laughs> yeah, I suppose you've got the hard end of it as well, being a defender. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, I want to be on their team. I don't want yeah. to. <laughs> can I can I change positions? Retrain me, please. Yeah. Take me off more like. <laughs> yeah. That's it. Let's uh, let's get into some of the uh, let's get into some questions about the team you're at at the moment. Um, let's uh, let's get into who's the best dresser. That's how I go. Best dresser. I'd have to give it to. Um, there's a guy who has a he's. You know, he's a proper go every day. His name's Johnny Dunleavy. Um, yeah. You know, I wouldn't say he's... Ah, uh, yeah, he'd be the best dresser, but he's very he's an old-fashioned dresser. Right. You know, he's, he's 28 now, but he dresses like maybe a 40-year-old man. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, he pulls it off, to be fair to him. So, uh, I'd, give, I'd give it to old Johnny, yeah. Yeah. Uh, worst dresser. Worst dresser. Lewis Banks. Um Love the he fact you dig someone out real quick yeah, there. Straight away. Yeah. He, he, he's, if he's if he listens to this, he'll know you know for a fact I'll say him. Um, <laughs> he signed last last year, two or no, two years ago. He was at Stoke underage all his life and then he came over to us. But uh yeah, he's um definitely got the worst dress. That's <laughs> so anyway. <laughs> uh who sorts the music out in the changing room? Do you have anyone that's Yeah. That? Um our striker, Ronan Cochlin. He's uh yeah. He's a music man, yeah. So some decent tunes in there, but then also a few questionable ones. But just have to bite your tongue and get on with it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, one one thing we heard um, last night. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna say this to everyone who comes on, Adam, because I think it's a brilliant idea. We had yeah, somebody who he um he manages a non-league team in the Suffolk area, right? And he what they do now is everyone they rotate who selects the music. Right. Okay. In the dressing room, and if you don't organise music to be played for the game, you have to pay a fine. <laughs> and he just right. said, like, he just said, obviously that then goes towards the end of the, se- the end of season do, but then also it keeps the variety of the music in the changing room, yeah, so it's kind of like yeah. the same and keeps it a bit different. So you know, you know, maybe something to think about with the lads when you go back it's to not training. Not a bad idea, to be fair. Take that to the players' meeting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> drop it in, drop it First in. Day back. <laughs> yeah. yeah, by the way, lads, forget all about how you've been. Don't worry about all the quarantine. I've got a great idea for you. <laughs> uh, when you're out, best dancer? Best dancer? Oh, let me see. When we're out, um, I'm trying to think now. When's the last time we're out as a team? Because we only had six or seven weeks of our season done, and then this all happened. Yeah, yeah. Let me see. Uh, 
just trying to think. Oh, Ed McGinty, our goalkeeper, has a few moves. Yeah. Yeah, Scottish fella. Um, big guy. Yeah, to look at him, you'd think awkward as anything. Wouldn't be able to do anything, but <laughs> a few vodkas down his neck. He's a different. different <laughs> <one. laughs> yeah, Ed McGinty, yeah. He's got a few, few moves away now. So, speaking of drink, who can't handle their drink on a night out? Let's see. Who can't handle their drink? Um, I'm trying to think, though. <laughs> That's not a good sign if I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> it's been so long. <laughs> um, let me see. I'm trying to think of the young lads. Um, I might have to go for... I might have to go for Lewis Banks again, actually. Um, yeah. There was a team night out, I think. It might have actually been um, during pre-season, one that I missed because the misses, because of the kids, obviously. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I got a few Snapchats of Lewis. Um, you know, I don't want to say too much, but he didn't really remember them the next day, so <laughs> I'm going to have to say Lewis again. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fair enough. That's fair enough. Um, who's the best trainer? David Cawley. Or yeah. centre midfielder, yeah, he's he's a joke. He was uh, he actually played with Ipswich, uh, underage, right? Okay. David Cawley, yeah, he's and then he's been back here. Um, he's been back in this league since he left Ipswich, but yeah, he's he's a joke of a player. So he's definitely the best trainer. Again, yeah, there's no hesitation, so you can tell. Yeah, straight in. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Let's see if there's any hesitation on this one. Worst trainer. Worst trainer. Ah, there's a few up there. <laughs> worst trainer. Um, let me see you now. The worst trainer. Who's who's who are we gonna dig out? I in? can't say I can't say Lewis again. <laughs> um, I was gonna say, is he gonna get a hat trick? <laughs> let me see. Um, there's a big big guy who unfortunately got injured for us uh, this year in pre season. He broke his leg. Oof. Um, but uh, his name's John Mahan and he's a bit. Uh, He's a bit of a messer in training, so uh, <laughs> so I'd give him worse trainer as well, yeah. <laughs> Brilliant stuff. There is one final question on there, but I'm going to save it towards the end because actually somebody has asked that um, right. one of the Facebook questions, so I'll save that towards the end when we do the Twitter questions. But some uh, some great answers in there, Adam, don't you, when you say? Yes, and uh, that, was, that was good fun to go through. Yeah, definitely. So like your new questions as well, James. Yeah, well, there you go. I'm, I'm trying to mix it up. I don't well want done. to keep. I don't want to keep doing the same thing time and time again. So, uh, we'll, we'll, if there's any questions that you guys want me to add in for future episodes, let me know down in the comment section, and we'll. Uh... Maybe we we'll change Chinese or Indian to pizza or kebab, Ooh, and then then see what dirty takeaway people like. I tell you what, whilst you, <laughs> while we've asked it, let's get Carl's opinion on it. What's, what's your? Uh, I would your I'd go kebab, kebab, yeah. Yep. Kebab, yeah. Uh, no, Not much for pizza lover me. I'm a massive pizza lover, but then if I'm given a kebab, I absolutely smash it. <laughs> <laughs> Give it a go anyway. Yeah. Brilliant stuff. I, I, like I said, I love some of those answers in there. Right, let's get into the nitty gritty um, of the podcast. I sent you over um, kind of the talking points that we would go through this evening. I, I'm fascinated to hear from your perspective um, – what's what you think of what is going on in the in the english leagues at the moment especially with the pyramids and how they've all been set up but before we kind of get into that just kind of explain to people who are in the uk um how ireland has set their rules um for for sort of like the lockdown has there been anything in place to what on the level that we're seeing over here and how has that affected you um as a player let's, let's just kick off with that to begin yeah. with um I mean, we've actually been in lockdown now for maybe, maybe I'd say about six, six weeks, seven weeks, like total lockdown. Like you, you're not allowed to bring your kids to the shops, nothing like that there. You're not allowed right. to go within two kilometers from your house. You're only allowed to get out once a day for exercise. You know, um, there's like police checkpoints all over the roads around here so the police will pull you in and say like what's your purpose of your journey really or, yeah and if you haven't got like a, a proper reason or whatever you know they'll pull you in for questioning or whatever Correct. um yeah there's been i've known people who's been getting like 
fines for just walking around the streets like for no reason and stuff that there so it's been it's been very strict over here but the you know the death toll is dropping very quickly um i think today it was announced that there was only about i think it was about 12 12 died with it in the last couple of days or something here yeah so yeah it's been it's been fairly strict here but it's it's obviously working yeah to some extent um but then, as you asked me the question earlier about Twitter, you know, I seen on Twitter last night, there's been uproar about Boris Johnson. And, you know, we, we didn't really get much of that over here because yeah, correct. obviously our TV channels are Irish and also mm, yeah. not really to terms with what's happening over there. But I don't think a lot of people are, are happy with his decisions, I guess. I think uh, shit show is probably the polite way of <laughs> yeah. Utter, utter, con- utter confusion. Uh, like it's interesting to hear like a different take on it. Um, we had Justin Wally on, uh, who's currently living in Latvia, um, and his take on it was absolutely unreal compared to what we've got. I mean, you know, he was still going out to a pub and meeting a mate once a week, and it wasn't a problem. Um, and their number of cases was absolutely minuscule. Um, yeah, whereas... I think the day we, we, the day we spoke to him, there was one confirmed case in the whole country. Now, obviously, you have to put it into scale. They are a very small country, but still, yeah. the moment it was all, the moment they knew that this was happening, their borders were shut down. Everything went into complete closed. Nothing's coming in or out of the country. Look, yeah. this is what you would have to do. Just follow these rules. But we we, we seem to have just it's been so flimsy. Um and I'm just I, I said that was why I was kind of keen to kind of find out what was going on in Ireland, but it's sounds like you've got far more control than what we have. Yeah, he's from a government uh, level. Yeah, the government here have took took good measures to be fair, and it's it's working. So you know, it was it was locked down for four weeks. Um and we got the review on the 1st of May, and then they said, right, we're going to put you on lockdown for another, or until the 18th of May. Mm. Yeah. We'll see how everything is. And then, you know, they've been putting building blocks in place with certain places open on certain dates, you know, et cetera. Mm. So, um, yeah, they're obviously looking looking towards, you know, coming out of it sooner rather than later. But he said, like, as long as the death toll keeps dropping, you know, that's that's the main thing. Yeah. From a very sort of human level, what are you finding it like with kids? Because that's the bit that, like myself, like my little one's not used to it. Like, it, it, he's finding it so hard. Yeah. yeah. Um, like my little one's only three years old, and I think like the fact that you can't just go and have a kick about very easily until the other day. You know, all these weeks of it, just so tough. Yeah, oh yeah, there's like my, my lads, my little lads too, and then my daughter's only seven months, so she's all right, like she's, she hasn't a clue, if she would just sleep at night, would be all right, but uh, <laughs> <it's>, uh, <laughs> the little lad, like before all this happened, um, you know, me, my missus just got back from Norwich, um, she was over visiting her family, and the day they landed back, you know, he asked, asked her to go to Dublin Zoo, and we're like two hours from Dublin. Yeah. So like I said, yeah, I'll take you the weekend after daddy's work after I have a match or whatever. So our match actually got cancelled. Or we were in we were supposed to play on a Friday night, um, away at a team called Derry City. But we were in training on Thursday morning and our gaffer came in and just explained everything. Look, boys, you just have to go home. Like this is what's happening, blah blah blah. We'll be in touch in the next two weeks. Yeah. So went home and then there was actually an announcement on the telly that night that like we were going into like lockdown or whatever. Then tried to explain it to a two-year-old. Look, we can't go to the zoo. And then, oh, there was murder at the house. And then, <laughs> yeah, uh, I can imagine. So yeah. um, we've had to, we've had to make do at the house. You know, you know, little bits, colour and painting. You know, cutting the grass, whatever it may be. But there's only so much a two-year-old can do before he starts going mad again. But um, yeah, we're we're trying our best and. You know, I think that the little, the my seven month old is now starting to crawl, so she's keeping a little bit busy like, <laughs> stealing these toys and stuff. So, not too bad. Oh dear. Because from your perspective, obviously from a from the Irish Premier League, you guys have only played what four games um, this season so far. Yeah, um, only four games. Yeah. But um, it, it, by the sounds of things, it was the decision was made very quickly that. Because over here, we had, it was only until, um, I can't remember, was, was it Mikko Arteta, wasn't it, who got, That's right, got, yeah. got COVID-19. Everyone was like, oh, okay, we better start taking this seriously now. That yeah. 
decision decision was finally made. But from your but from what you're saying, it was very quickly decided. No, that's it. Season. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like we, we were in the train on a Thursday morning, like expecting to do game prep or whatever. You know, we're all in the in the change rooms getting ready to head out training. And the gaffer just comes in and like we obviously knew there was this virus coming around. You know, it was in the UK or it was in Spain or Italy or whatever. And mm. then he came in, you know, and he just said, "We we spoke to the league." We spoke to like the players' union and all. And he said that's a scrap for two weeks. There's no game tomorrow. We'll be in touch. And then that was it. Like like it obviously hadn't hit Ireland. I don't think at that time it wasn't that bad in Ireland anyway. Yeah. But he said, "Look, go home." Again, it's the measures being taken from an early point, isn't it? That's it. Yeah. Like just go home, stay in your house, and don't go out unless you need to. But um, he just sent us home straight away, and I think that was probably the right decision, to be honest. Yeah, and we we all, we've asked this to a couple of um, pros that have been on the the show at the moment. When when that decision was made, were you giving any sort of uh, maybe dietary plan or any training plans that to to kind of follow in the in the weeks after that, or have the club pretty much just said, look, just kind of keep on top of your fitness, and we'll figure this out as and when a return does happen? Um, no, we've been given everything. You know, we've been given all these. You know, home workouts and stuff, and yeah, I remember yeah. you saying you saying earlier about the Strava app that we actually have to use that because it's just the managers looking at us. <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah. He keeps an eye on us, and like if you don't don't do your runs, like he might drop a text here and there. But um, yeah, we we wow. four four runs a week to do, um, and then you've got like your ball circuits, and then you know a few boys have like a few bits at home, like whether it be pull up bars, boxing bags, you know, spin bikes or whatever. Yeah. Mm. So he just says, "Look, get your runs done. It'll be as game realistic as as it can be. You know, interval sort of stuff." And then he said, "If you've got anything at home, do extra and keep yourself topped up." But you know, it's it's you know, it's hard. You know, you're waking up in the morning and you're thinking, "Like, when's this going to end?" You've got no end date. You're just you're kind of running through the roads and you're like, oh, "What am I running for?" Sort of thing. Yeah. Do you know, but, we've um, had we've had different opinions from people like. Um, we had one person come on saying they were more determined than everyone felt that they were in the best shape they have been yeah. uh, because of it. Then we had someone else come on. They they said, I, I don't really know what I'm training for. Yeah, that's, that's the way I feel like. Don't, I don't know when I'm going back, and I don't know if I do go back, what's going to happen when I go yeah. back. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so so motivation's know. hard. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. So, But, yeah, we just get a, we just get a different program sent them every Saturday, and then you just, just crack on with it, and then... Hopefully you hear then by the end of the week that you're in training, whenever it may be. But I can't see that anytime soon over here anyway. As an individual, are you someone that like thrives off a competitive mentality? Sorry? Are you as an individual, are you someone that sort of thrives off a competitive mentality? Is that what you think makes the training harder? Yeah, yeah, like, so, you know, so yeah. yeah. Yeah, definitely. But okay. like it's Good just job. you know, running the roads is just horrible, you know. <laughs> Going out doing ten k's. I'm not built for that. I'm, I'm built to head and kick it. Do you know what I mean? Well, yeah. to be honest, as well, the difference between actually going to training on a grass pitch or a three G surface to then going out running on the streets from your from an ankle perspective, you're then bashing it against hard concrete as well. You you know you're you're but you've been designed over the years to play in a certain way to then ask you to do training and exercise where your ankles are not going to be used to that potentially. That could also have a bit of an effect as well. Do you know what I mean? That that's yeah, something yeah. that a lot of people don't really consider. Yeah, I agree. There, you know, I spoke. There was actually one lad who lived in my estate um, from the team as well, and I spoke to him, and he's he's had bothers his ankle the last couple of weeks. So you know, he's went and got himself a spin bike or whatever just to to keep on top of it. So yeah, yeah, it's just completely different to what we're used to. You know, it's, mm. you're doing short and sharp stuff on a football pitch, and then you're going out and five six mile runs a day like so it's completely different training but I suppose you have to get it done or yeah i'd be pretty confident that when players go back like the equipment they use is going to be slightly different i don't think people will be using these like silly like woolen boots as much anymore with no ankle support whatsoever because i think there's going to be a period of time that's gone on where strength isn't quite as where it should be yeah. It does make me wonder if there'll be a demand for slightly different equipment and stuff over what's become almost fashionable in the norm. Yeah, yeah, I know. Do you know, um, do you know what I mean? Puma Kings. Yeah, literally, like just for, just like a good solid footing rather than these tornado shaped blades on top of <laughs> what is something my nana knitted, you know? 
Definitely. Um, um, when I was when I when um, I was doing my research today, um, prior to you coming on, I did I picked up a couple of articles where um, the league initially, I believe, had a date set for the nineteenth of June that they wanted mm-hmm. to try and come back by. But from one I've seen um, that was posted maybe a couple of days ago, they're now talking about a potential return on the twentieth of July. Um, as a, as a player, how much do you? How much are you in the loop about those kind of things? Are you ever consulted about it? Um, are you asked for your opinions? You know, for because as I said, we've had a couple of people from the uh, from from the English leagues who have given us their take on what happens. But from an you know from an Irish league perspective, how does that kind of work? Do you, are you kind of in the loop with what happens? So um, there's a uh, one player from each team who. You know, you've got the PFA in England. It's called yeah, the, yeah. the PFAI yeah. over here. You know, Association of Ireland or whatever. Mm-hmm. There's one player from each team who is a representative for each club, and obviously we have our player group chat or whatever. And he'll go to a meet. Well, he can't go to a meetings now, but they have the Zoom call every Friday night or Saturday morning, and then he'll just he'll just update us then and WhatsApp. He'll drop a voice note in or a or a document that the FAI or the PFAI has sent over to him. Okay. And, you know, all these dates have been thrown around, you know, but there hasn't been any like real confirmation. Okay. So, like I've spoke to a few people, um, and a lot of people, a lot of the ones I've spoke to have said September, earliest. Really. So, and these people would be, you know, reliable enough sources. Um. So you're hearing different dates there, and you're just thinking, right? So let's go out for another run here, and I'll be back <laughs> kicking the ball in three months' time, sort of thing. Yeah, because so, because uh, obviously from 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 an Irish league perspective, obviously we we've been talking a lot, haven't we, Adam? From an English um, non league, that we're over three quarters of a way for a season, um, whereas you guys have barely kicked off. You know, four yeah. five games have been played. Has there been much talk about if it is going to be July or even if it is September? Uh, has uh, what kind of debates have there been had to? to when a season is going to be started or do you think it will be that they just kind of go well do you know what if it is going to be september let's just scrap it and and start again when we're in a better position so yeah there's been no there's been no real chat about scrapping it yet but um right a lot of ones and there's been no real talk about when the league starts that it's restarting from where it took off or is it just restarting altogether again sort of thing right um but there was talk about if the league is back in September. Um, I mean, they're trying their best to get the league back this season, no matter what. Like that's that's the first one they want to do. Really? Normally, normally our league finishes in October. So they were saying like we play four rounds of games in Ireland. Um, they were saying we're going to scrap a round of games, and then oh, okay. yeah, and then hopefully try finish it by December time. Mm. But. And then there's people then then there's other like committee things saying like well we'll start it in September keep around keep that round of games and we'll go on into February, but then that has a knock on effect then for the year after because our season yeah. starts in February. Yeah. So, so all that has to be weighed up. You know I don't know what's going to happen like if they if they start it in September and they manage to get it finished by December that would probably be ideal. Mm. So you have time to rest up and recover and go again February, but. I think you're yeah. in a bit of a different scenario because of how your season has started. Yeah, yeah. Like it, it doesn't. There's not quite as much risk of a not knock-on effect. Yeah. Whereas, like yeah. In, in England, like I'll be honest with you, there's been conversations like of people just saying, "Well, next season probably won't happen either." Or like, you know, I know that the the thing is that they want to get it done, but at lower levels, they're thinking like, "How can how will that, how will that work?" And I suppose when your season's been delayed, the time when the virus has hit actually yeah. means there might not be as much impact. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean, yeah. So it's, you know, it's just, I suppose, the right people making the right decisions at the end of the day. Um, but, you know, as, as we were chatting about before, you know, the right decisions being made in certain places. Mm. So we just have to wait and see, I guess. I mean, before we move on to kind of getting your thoughts on the English um, situation and what's been, you know, what's been going on with our leagues over here, um, I've I've read about um, I don't know if you've seen this one. Derry City's manager um, uh, Declan Devine has come out saying yeah. he believes that regionalised divisions may be the answer yeah. um, to get the you know to get the Irish league 
back up and running. Just very quickly, your thoughts on that? Could that be something that is a possibility? Um, would that would that be something that works? Because I mean, again, just from my very brief knowledge of Irish football, and I'm talking football manager terms only here, um, <laughs> when you're looking at regionalised side of things and the cup competitions that you can potentially win, the, the, the gulf in quality between the teams in your particular regions is quite vast, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know if that's realistic, to be honest. You know, obviously, he's, he's thought about it and he's, he's had a say on it, but... Um... It's, it's a weird one for me. You know, I think if, if the league can start up at all, you might as well just get everyone back together. You know, mm. where Sligo's, if we're playing Dundalk, he's saying regionalise, you know, if Sligo's playing Dundalk, it's it's three hours away. Yeah, it's so, the complete opposite side of the country, isn't it? That's yeah. what I mean. So, yeah. And then if we're playing Shamrock Rovers, who then isn't in our region, they're two and a half hours away. Mm. So, you know, for me, I think you should just get the league back if you can, and never mind the regional sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Interesting. Um, let's move on to your kind of thoughts um, about what's going on over here. We, myself and Adam, are he- very heavily invested within um, non-league football. Um, Adam works um, and is actually in, actually employed by a non-league football side who are top of the table, miles oh. clear in a division, and their season's been completely scrapped. Yeah, it's, it's just been completely taken away. What what do you make of, of of what's been going on? How much have you been kind of looking into you know into the English side of things? Um, uh, uh, what what do you make of how of the situation as it's been developing? Um, yeah, I've been I've been reading, you know, go back to Twitter again. That's all that's been going on Twitter. You know, it's been interesting yeah. to read yeah. what different leagues and that's doing. Um, I see. Is it the League One and League Two? Have they have they stopped stopped altogether, or what's happened there? Um, the late, the this week, isn't it? There's going to be a decision, I think. Yeah, I think they're having a vote this week um, on how to de- how to decide it um, because a number of the mid-table teams are saying that we can't financially survive. Yeah, continuing, we need to have the season abolished. Of course, um, yeah. But a lot of the teams, especially, I mean, D- um, what's his name? Is it Dara McKenzie? I can't remember his name. The Peterborough. Uh, owner. Oh yeah. Anthony, He's, yeah, yeah. yeah, he has been so vocal yeah. about about getting the season continued because obviously they're in the playoffs and they're wanting to push for oh, you know push yeah. for promotion. Um, but yeah, I think a vote is happening this week. But further down, the non-league side of it yeah. has just been completely scrapped, and they're I think they're now having a vote, aren't they, Adam? The top three to top. Top three divisions of non-league having a vote to yeah, that's going to happen at a very season. similar time. But again. My opinion is they're all going to try and hold each other's hands, I think, and mm. you know follow follow the lead. I don't think they'll be too yeah. splitting in that vote now. It wouldn't make sense at this point. Now it's gone on. You know, we uh, originally we were talking like, well, why don't we wait till May for a decision? We might as well say we're in the middle of May when this decision mm. is going to be made, and it's still clear as mud. Yeah, yeah. To, to be honest, um, like further down. The, the pyramid, like in England, within two days, a decision was made and it was null and void. And it was yeah. ratified within about 10 days um, by the English FA. Right. Um, th- there wasn't too much thought given to it. But I think what worries me now, and I suppose this is something that w- could affect you yourself, Carl, is the fact that we're now talking about altering the w- rules of football to accommodate a restart. Right. Uh, yeah. Over here. And I think they they knew that at non-league level they couldn't do all of that. I think there was early signs that they knew the things that they would have to do to get it underway. And they knew that there was no loss of revenue like in terms of TV and everything, so they could bin it off. At the levels which they've selected where no decisions have f- firmly been made, all of those things do matter. Um, but now we're starting to have discussions about changing the rules. Like there is no integrity left in the competition if you start doing five subs. Yeah. No VAR. Yeah, no. VAR becomes optional. Yeah, um, they're talking about. Um, like I know it's going to be tough, but I, I can't see how you can continue under a completely different rule set. Yeah. No, I know what you mean. Yeah, it's going. It will be tough, hundred percent. So. Like I, w- I wouldn't play Monopoly. Have my dinner. Come back and say, well. Uh, before you could only roll two dice, now you can roll three. Yeah, yeah, understand. Yeah. Do, do you know what I mean? And yeah. I, I, I don't understand. 
if we can have a fair competition or a title that's worth anything, if that's what they decide to do. Yeah. You can't. I mean, the, the latest thing that came out today, I don't know if you've seen it, Adam, is that um, all of the Premier League clubs had a, had a meeting today and they all rejected playing games at a neutral venue. And I'm not surprised. Because, no, but that was the thing because they were they were saying the top the bottom six teams were the ones causing the issue with that, saying yeah. that they wanted to have their games being played at their home venues because that gave them an advantage. And yeah. apparently, the Premier League came out and said, "Well, you know, there will be ra- there will be ramifications if you reject this." And then every team came out and rejected it today. Yeah. So that just that just puts more question marks on when this is all going to start and get going again. It's just. Utter, utter chaos. Like, well, I made my hundred percent. Like I made my points clear on last night's podcast about the benefits of a neutral venue in terms of virus control and the fact that you could actually create an environment where people wouldn't really need to leave. Um, like you could create training camps and everything, and it would all be very enclosed, and they could look after it a lot better. But like you say, a home stadium is a competitive edge. Yeah, yeah. You, you will know. You're like Kyle. I'm sure you'll know yourself the, the yeah. dimensions of your pitch, like where the fans are, the noise that you get from it, like the yeah. feel that you get, the way that things are laid on in terms of the dressing room and stuff. That's it. Yes, you're used to it. Like you're you're comfortable there. Yeah, and like being with Stone Market, you go like you do everything you can when you're an away team. Yeah, but the standard does drop. Yeah, because yeah. the surroundings are not the same. So you're trying to recreate something, not making the everyday happen, and and that's different. Yeah, um, competitively. And yeah, you can see where them bottom six clubs are coming from, hundred percent. Yeah, um, it's nice to know that there's some camaraderie within it, though. It's, yeah. yeah, it is nice to know that they've all kind of banded together and just told the Premier League, look, we're not going to have our, we're not going to be dictated to like that. I, I didn't think they would, to be honest. I, I, I didn't. I wasn't expecting that. Um, but but it has, it's good to see that they're all banded together and just, you know, not so much a middle finger, but just a look. You know, you've got to do things sensibly here. But that, that's that, that's one thing, though, to show that we're not ready to resume in a way that's going to fit everyone. If mm. I go back to the five subs thing, which has been spoken about quite widely, like surely that shows you that we're not ready to actually resume. We're not going to be ready to do it in time. No. no we're going to have to use five substitutes for the sake of fitness. Yeah, and I feel sorry not... for whoever the other six are on the pitch that's going to have to do the full 90. Yeah. Um, because with the, with the schedule that will be required in England, it will be quite intensive. And I'm sure with yourself, Carl, unless they can extend things and then drop pre-season exactly, yeah. the next year, you're going to still have to ramp your fixtures up. Yeah. yeah. Like, that'll be tough going. Oh, you still got to train. 100%. Yeah, to keep, you know, obviously games are a lot more intense but then if the games are coming around you know quick quick and fast you know you've got you've got less time to recover so you're going to burn out a lot quicker when you play a game no matter what day of the week it is is the next day a rest day so yeah we play a game just say saturday whatever Um, yeah we'll be we'd be in on sunday for recovery then we'll be off the day after and then you're back into training the day after the day off sort of thing see that's an impossible that in itself yeah. is impossible yeah. with the, with the that schedule that would be required. And, and that yeah. would go through all football. The, the, the practicalities of it are so, so hard to work out. Because where do you do your recovery? Where do you fit your rest days? And then, yeah. therefore, how are you affecting your overall conditioning of yeah. the athletes? Yeah, yeah. Definitely. definitely. It's an interesting one. But, you know, for everyone listening, let us know your thoughts. Uh, down in the comment section and get involved in the conversation on Twitter as well. We're always open to a discussion on that. Um, just let us know what you think and as I said, what you know, what would be the right thing to do. Kyle, let's let's go and talk about your time in football. I'm I'm, I'm fascinated to hear um, your your career, what what you know, how you've got to where you are at the moment. Um, let's go right back to the beginning. Um, before you joined Norwich, what was your career, you know what was your footballing journey like to that point? Where were you playing before the Norwich move came before around? Norwich, um, I was just playing, you know, in my local hometown, um, a place called Remelton. Uh, the team was called Swilly Rovers. Um, 
you know, it was just, it was the only kind of, it was only only team in that town, um, you know, so I, I think I only started playing football, maybe I was under 10s. Right. Um, and then, you know, just, you know, my mum and dad just brought me to every training session, you know, every game, you know, my dad was involved at their age, uh, managing, mm-hmm. coaching, um, just kind of worked, worked my way up, you know, as as best as I could, you know, I got into like I was playing senior football at fourteen, fifteen. Um because wow. 'cause I was quite big, you know, I was tall. Yeah. Um, and you know, the standard and like it's like a Sunday league, you know, pub league, you know, as long as you can head it and kick it, you're a baller sort of thing. <laughs> 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 so worked my way up there, yeah, at fourteen and then you go into like a county section. So the county I'm from is Donegal. Um yeah. Yeah, and then you get picked for like a county team. Um, so that started under twelves, I think maybe under twelves. Yeah, then right. you go to like all Ireland tournaments around Ireland. You know, you play your Dublin's, your Sligo's. You know, all the counties. Mm. And there's a big, there's a big tournament. There's two big tournaments called. There's one called the Galway Cup, and there's one called the Kennedy Cup. And I was representing my county there, and I had two good tournaments. Um. And then the scouts started approaching my dad and, you know, kept getting more and more interest. Um, and, you know, spoke to a few people and they kind of said, you know, and until the clubs, like, contact you over the phone and have flights booked, like, don't really get your hopes up. Right. So that was grand. So, you know, um, coach, scouts kept coming up to my dad and all these tournaments or whatever. He was chatting to them, yeah, no problem, blah, blah, blah. Here's my number. And we mm. did hear from a few, you know, I went so then we went to before I went on my trials, um we I got called up to the Irish under fifteens. Um yeah. that was where where I started then my Irish football, my first trip away, I think we went to Qatar. Oh wow. We, yeah, yeah. At we, that we, age that must have been so exciting. Yeah, oh yeah, it was, it was like it was mental, it was crazy. Yeah, I know at any age that'd be exciting, but yeah. What so, what was that like when you got the call to say that's what's gonna have, be happening? So yeah, it was it was a bit mad. Like I was obviously I'm fourteen at the time and still in school or whatever, and you know, someone says, Oh, you're going to guitar and I'm thinking, Where the hell is this place? <laughs> so <laughs> locked it up and all and locked up where we were staying and where we were going and I was like, Jesus, this place is unbelievable. So it's a place called the Aspire Academy, I'm not sure if you've heard of it. It's like no, it's, it's, I can't even explain it, like it's got three or four basketball courts five or six football pitches, swimming pools, everything, like, so I went over there anyway for a week, um, came back from there, um, and then I started going on my trials, my first, my first trial, I think I went to, it was Aston Villa, yeah, I went to Aston Villa for two weeks, um, that was good, it was a good experience, you know, felt, it was a bit tough at the start, because it's a completely different standard to what you're used to, sure, back, back in Ireland, you know, Sunday League football, going into academy football. Yeah. And then I went to Falkirk in Scotland yeah. for, for a few weeks. Uh, they wanted to sign me. Um, I went to Leicester. Uh, who else did I go to? Black, Blackburn. They offered me a deal as well. Um, who else? And then I went to Norwich. Yeah. I went to Norwich and then yeah, I went into Norwich for a week. Played a played a game there. Um, Gary Holt and Ricky Martin and Neil Adams were the yeah. three over. Or Neil Adams and Gary Holt were the were the two that were over the under 16s at the time. Yeah, yeah. And Ricky Martin was the academy manager. Yeah. And um, we played uh, we played Aston Villa and a friend and a yeah and a friendly at uh, uh, the training ground in Norwich. And, yeah. Um, yeah. After that, there you know I went home for a while and then Ricky gave my dad a call and said you know we want to take Kyle out to um out to Guernsey for a tournament okay so yeah we went out to Guernsey and we played three games out there can't remember the teams now we played against um but yeah I played three games out there and then Ricky offered me a deal um there and then so we grabbed it with both hands because uh I felt Norwich reminded me a lot of home as well you know, well, um, well, one of the things that Norwich are actually quite good at, we we have brought over a lot of players from Ireland to be part of the part of the academy setup. Um, yeah, you know, one one player that's currently in there at the moment is Simon Power. 
you know, yeah. he's, he's still in and around that setup. Is that something that was that a, was that a big factor for deciding to join Norwich? You know, at the time, or what? I'm just kind of curious. You had those offers from Falkirk. You had, you know, you had the offer um, from Blackburn. Were were these all at the same time as the Norwich trials, or were they kind of all staggered? And is there any reason why you decided not to go to those 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 clubs as well? Um, yeah, they were, they were they were all similar times. You know, I think all the the all the trials happened within a year, um, and all the deals were there with, within a year. And you know, my dad said okay. to every club. Um, He's not. Um, he's not going to make a decision till he's done his exams. Uh, so every cl- okay. every club knew what what how long they had to wait for before an answer. Okay. That's, um, that's... <laughs> so yeah, I had time on my side there anyway. But went to Norwich and I just loved it. The people there, the people at the club were brilliant. You know, Colin Watts um, was the one who brought me over, and he was top. I think he could still be involved somewhere at Norwich, but he was. I think he, he top is, yeah. class. Um, and the lads as well were, were were brilliant lads. So yeah. I just clicked clicked with the boys and clicked with the people in the club straight away. And um, yeah, that was you know it was the right decision to sign there, hundred percent. Definitely, definitely. Um, sorry, Adam, did you want to? No, no, no. Sorry, I thought I heard, thought I heard you ask it before you were about to jump in with something. Next. No, no. Like I was just just like pretty fascinated to hear how like getting picked up, moving on to <clears throat> making making that choice. Like uh, at a young age, I think uh, it always fascinates me to know how people can make that choice. And I think that... I think what, what is quite impressive for me is the fact that your your dad was so, you know, he he made that you know he's not doing anything until he sorted out his exams. That that for me is very, yeah. I'm, I'm very impressed with that. Yeah, to. yeah. So I mean, I left school at sixteen, and then, I, and then I, that was it. I was, I was straight into full time football. Yeah. And so, was... so then yeah. making that move over to Norwich talk to me about your your feelings at the time when you were going over there is it just is it just excitement are you you know are you nervous what what, what are you feeling at that point this is obviously this is then your first full-time part of an you know part of an academy yeah. set I think um you know when I got offered the deal um I think it might have been like six months say before I, I moved over Okay. You, know, you get offered the deal, you know, you sign it, you scan it all back or whatever, and then, you know, you're buzzing, you know, you're top of the world, running around to your family, you know, oh, I'm Simon Norris, blah, 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 <laughs> you know, and then, you know, as time gets closer, you know, maybe a week before you're going over, you're, you're a bag of nerves, you're like, yeah. you know, that's me done, like, I'm, I'm leaving Ireland, yeah. like, what, what's going to happen now, I'm going over to Norwich sort of thing, um, don't know anyone, sort of, sort of thing that day, but that's, that's what I mean by the players and, and the staff were brilliant with me coming over. They really helped me settle in. And if I was ever struggling, like missing home or anything, you know, they'd, they always had their phone on or, you know, they'd always look after me. And I mean, they got me an Xbox and a PlayStation and everything to make me feel at home. So right. they, they were they were top class at, at dealing with players coming in from abroad. So. Yeah. But yeah, it was, I was definitely a bag of nerves moving over. I'm I'm just I'm just curious to kind of find out, especially at that age, um, from an accommodation perspective, how how does that work in an academy when you are moving over from a different country? Do the club kind of set you up with something? Is that kind of where, you know, where we have like a club liaison who's you know who helps you out with that side of things? What what's yeah. the situation with that? They're, um, so they put you in digs, um, and then the club kind of digs say liaison officer at the time. Um, kind of looked after the scholars was right. Jimmy Unwin he's now a coach at Cambridge United he was yes. he was brilliant with me you know if I ever you know felt homesick he was the first person I go to if I need flights home he yes. was the first man I go to and he'd sort of flights out or you know take me out for a coffee or something just to you know take my mind off missing home but um mm. you know he put me in <clears throat> he put me in a good digs um there was a uh, four there was me and three other players um, there was a guy called Matt Ball, who he played with Northern Irish underage teams or whatever, you know, and um, obviously from him knowing boys from Ireland, it kind of helped him settle me in a bit. Yeah, you know, he was he was a pro at the time, a young pro. I think he might have been a first year pro or a second year pro. So, um, and then there was Richard Brindley as well. I think he's at Notch County now. 
Right. Um, so them two boys looked after me massively because they were older and they knew I'd moved o- over from Ireland and, you know, they'd obviously moved up from wherever it had been, London or whatever. But um, mm. it's a bit of a difference coming up from London than Ireland. But, uh, yeah, they definitely helped me settle in. Then there was another guy, Joe Peacock, who was there, who's from Cambridge. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So, yeah, it was, it was spent, you know, just four lads and we clicked, you know, we... With a good laugh and the digs people there was Don and John Wood who were they were older but they were brilliant for me, you know. They just gave us the run of the house and said, you know, go in and use the telly, go on and eat what you want, do what you want, you know, make yourself at home. So yeah, it was it was right. the right digs to put me in at the time. Definitely. Um and you know, throughout the time before the um before the FA Youth Cup season, before that campaign you're still representing um, Ireland at a at a youth level at this point. Does that does that kind of thing then help to be still selected for that? So you are then given the opportunity to then come back home as well, um, you know, to, to to represent your country. Does that does that have a major factor in you know you settling into a place? Yeah, big time. You know, it's always it's always you know brilliant to represent your country. You know, the bosom and the club pull you in and say like, look, you you've been called up for the. 18s, 19s, 21s, whatever it may be, mm. you know, you're delighted at that, but in the back of your mind, you're thinking, right, I might get two days at home to see my mum and dad or my, my little brother and stuff like that there. Yeah. <clears throat> but the club always, like, if my training camp started on a Monday or a Tuesday, if we played a game on a Saturday in uh, Clooney at the, at the training ground, mm. you know, they'd let me fly home Saturday after the match. So I'd get two or three days at home and then I'd head to, like, Dublin for the training camp. And then they might give me a day or two at home then after the training camp and I could fly home. So, so yeah, they definitely looked after me in that sense that I could get home and see my family and stuff. Brilliant, brilliant stuff. So when you are in the, when you are in the youth team, as you're going up through um, through the, the kind of ages there, who, who are your managers? Um, obviously, we know um, Neil Adams was the manager for that particular season. Um, but, but who who were your managers as you were going up through that? Or was Neil your, always your, your kind of gaffer at that point? Um, so, yeah, when I first moved over, it was Neil and Gary Holt. Yeah. Um, what a legend. They, they were a... brilliant. Them two were brilliant. Um, you know, as I said in the interview I've done before, Neil, Neil's, Neil's one of the best I've worked under. He, he was class. Um, then when we went up, obviously we won the Youth Cup and ever, you know, um, then went up to 21s and then there was a few managers who went to <laughs> 21s. <laughs> yeah, Mark, there was. <laughs> Mark Robson. Um, Mark Robson, I think he could be involved with English FA somewhere now. Then we had um, Dale Brooks. Yeah. Dale, Dale Brooks, Paul Wilkinson. Dale Brooks is actually at Stowmarket now. Oh, is he? Yeah, the yeah, club that I work at. Is it yeah. really? Yeah, it's, it's that Brooksy. Yeah. Oh, okay. Wow, well, there you go. Dale Brooks, yeah. Um, and Paul Wilkinson was another one. Mm. I, I think that was it now. I hope I haven't missed anyone out. Yeah, no, that's just a fair show. But yeah, so, Neil, Neil was the one who gave me my, my debut at Norwich, so... Yeah. He was he was top class. Yeah. So, let, let's, con- let's, let's move on to that to that famous season with the FA Youth Cup. When you when you are involved at that, you know, at that time, when you're in the early rounds, does anyone ever mention about how far the club can go? Is this like the number one priority in an academy, the Youth Cup? Or, you know, how does it work? Are you mainly concentrating on the league perspective? Like talk me talk me through that before we kind of go through the actual run itself. You know, I think it's always good to do well on the league, but when the youth cup comes around, you know, there's always that excitement. Um, I know we definitely put the league like to bed. Like we we were done with the league when we were started to do well in the youth cup. Um, <laughs> Brilliant stuff. Um, uh, so yeah, leading up to youth cup, I think you know there's that excitement. Um, but I don't think I actually I speak for all the lads. I don't think we ever thought we'd we'd go on to win it. To be honest, mm. I think it was after we played QPR in the first game. <clears throat> and I think we played Millwall and then Everton, I think. And then it was after Everton when Big Carton Morris banged in a hat trick. Yeah. Like we were all looking at each other thinking, Jesus, like we have a right chance here, like you know, <laughs> let's give it a right go. So, um yeah, it was after the Everton game then where the league just went out the window, you know, we did, didn't kick a ball in any league games at all. Right. Um 
but yeah, no, there's there's definitely an excitement, and then you know after that game, it just clicked, and moving on to win the whole thing, it was crazy. Like, so at, at, at the time when you are going through um, through the <coughs> rounds, are the are the lads talking about? Is the excitement kind of getting? You know what? What is it like when you are going through that? That are you are you all talking about it? Is it something that you then that the confidence is then building as each kind of round goes on, or are the managers kind of like grounding you out and just you know putting you you know take you know calming things down? Yeah, you know Neil and Gary were very calming figures. Um, you know after we played QPR, you know good result there. The the crowds then maybe started to get a little bit bigger each round. <clears throat> so. Well, that, that's when we all started to get excited then you know seeing more and more faces come in to the ground and stuff um yeah. but as i said after we beat everton and we just knew like i think we had nottingham forest then i think in the next round yeah at home and, and carroll road i remember it was packed yeah so yeah it was it was definitely that that after that everton game then you know we probably did start getting excited you know when we were we were thinking like you know we could go on to win this and what if we do win it blah 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 yeah but, uh, yeah, it was it was it was a good journey. Yeah, that that first that first time playing in front of a crowd like that before you even get to the finals side of things, when you are at Carrow Road with a crowd of that size, what is that feeling like as a youngster that a club has put that much emphasis into its youth and has shown that much support? What was that? What was that feeling like? That was mad. I was I was nerve wracking to be fair walking out. Um, yeah, I think we walked, I think against Nottingham Forest, you obviously walk out the tunnel. I think the majority of the crowd were behind us. Yeah. So, as we walked out, you know, we didn't really see, you seen a fair bit in the, in the big stand as you walk out, but then you turn around to line up and do the handshakes and you're like, Jesus, like, look at the mountain I'm here. Mm. So then it hits you and you're like, look, there's no turning back now sort of thing. Yeah. So uh, we had a right go and then, um, yeah, I think it was, was the penalties at Carroll Road or, it went to penalties, didn't it? I think it did, yeah. I think yeah. it did. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I remember dying with cramp I'd seen that game. <laughs> 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 but yeah, no, it was it was brilliant. Yeah, the fan the couldn't believe the fans. Like I knew the fans were brilliant for the first team every week, you know, win, lose or draw. Yeah. Um, but they definitely came out in their numbers, you know, against Nottingham Forest and then against Chelsea in the final. It was sold out yeah. stadium or something crazy like that. Yeah. So when let let's let's move on to the final. When you when you are playing against Chelsea and the, the you know the, their youth their youth teams is is famous now isn't it do you know what I mean yeah, just, oh, the, yeah. Youth, the youth setup that they have at the moment is just absolutely ridiculous with with the talent that they've got and I'm, I'll just read out a few of these names for you especially for you Adam they had Christensen in the side who is now still there playing in their first team uh, Baker Swift Loftus Cheek. Kawamia, they had, you know, Roos <laughs> up top. They had some brilliant players yeah. in Nathan that team. He was there as well, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. I don't think he true. played though. Did he even play the final? I don't think. I don't think he did. No, not from what I could, not from what I've done and my research. I don't think he was. Um, he was playing, but when, when you're going up against the, against a team like that, are you not? In the build up, are you not really thinking about that? Are you just kind of so much on a high that? You just feel like you can take on anyone. I think yeah, we were we were obviously you know we were we knew the talent them guys had. Um, like I think someone going into the final, someone said like how much their team was worth or something crazy like that there. So um, I was just kind of thinking like, look, they're obviously going to be decent players, so I might as well just try to get a good kick at them if I can, sort of thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I had a few kicks, all right, but uh, like look, we we just. We knew we had the ability in our our um our, our squad to go and to go and turn over anyone. And as I said after the Everton game, you know we were full of confidence. Yeah. Um, you know we just we did, we mightn't have played much ball against Chelsea, but you know we we definitely outworked them and and you know outfought them and you know bullied them all over the park. You know, yeah. I think we probably probably shaked them up early on. Um. So they didn't know how to deal with us. We were just nitty gritty, and you know, kicking arms out of them and work. We went on to win it then. Yeah. So in that in that first leg, twenty two thousand fans at Carrow Road. The, the number of people coming up to watch it just upped another level. That must be an amazing experience for for yeah. somebody somebody at a young age, right? Definitely, yeah. And to know that they were all there for us, um, 
you know, that definitely helped. Uh, and I think, you know, obviously maybe a few of them are there to say, you know, Chelsea, you know, unbelievable youth team and that, but mm. um, just to almost sell out Carrow Road for, for a youth, youth cup game was just incredible. And then to go on and win it was even better, like. Yeah, and then that, that, that the return leg at Chelsea, you know, you're, you're going into that with a 1-0 lead from the first leg. 3,000 Norwich fans travel down to London to come and watch you again. That again, mad, that really. that is just that's just mental, isn't it? Really, when you think about it. Yeah, it was mad, and I think they definitely they definitely outshone the um the Chelsea ones. Anyway, I remember that day. That's yeah. the take away from that game. They never stopped. Um, my parents and my uncles actually flew over for that day, and I managed to get uh the Donegal flight, the county I'm in. The county I'm from, I managed to get them to throw the flag down and I had it wrapped around my neck for when we won nice. the celebration. <laughs> so uh, everyone at home was happy with that there anyway. But um, yeah, I mean, the fans at Norwich are, are incredible and, and they still are. Like they, mm. they never have a bad thing to say about the club, you know? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, when that final whistle goes and you have won it, when you think about all the all the players that have won it in the past, the, the successful youth teams that have come out of that, what you know? What are you, what are you thinking at that point in terms of your own career? Um, it must be a huge like turning point, like knowing, like you say, James, like for your own career, how big is that? Yeah, at that age, it's like obviously at youth age, it's massive. You know, yeah, Chelsea like won it for numerous years before that. I think that was our first win in like thirty years or something. Norwich's first win. Mm. So to be part of that, there, it's almost be like history is. It was brilliant, like, and then obviously after like the final whistle goes, you know, you're not really thinking about what what's going to happen next. You're just absolutely buzzing on the pitch, running around like mad. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, you know, days and weeks go by after, and you're thinking, you know, this, you know, it's a good thing to have behind you. You know, a few of us got offered new deals after that. Um, yeah, to stay on for a year or two after. Um, but yeah, it's just it's it's brilliant to be part of, you know, and the the squad who I was with as well at the time were just absolutely brilliant. You know, all the lads were were brilliant. You know, you can see a lot of them have gone on to do amazing things as well. Mm-hmm. Definitely. So at the at the end of that season then, after the after the team have had that much success, um the club are still in the Premier League at this point. They've had two seasons in the league. They're then entering in their third third season. What kind of conversations are had with the youth team about what's going to be happening for the next step? Um, I, I, is that kind of thing talked about as a team perspective? Did you have like an individual conversation to say, right, now that we've had this success, this is kind of like our our plan and our pathway for you to get in to the first team? How how does that kind of develop? Yeah, I mean, you don't they don't have it as a team sort of talk. I mean, you have your your individual talks with your managers, your coaches, mm-hmm. whatever. You know, you're, you're pulled in and, um, you know, I talk you through, like, where they're going to, like, keep you here for your development. Are we going to send you on loan? Or, right. you know, we're going to keep you training on the first team or 21s or whatever. You know, they've all got a plan set out for you. And, um, yeah, you know, it's just up to you to, to execute the plan, I suppose. Um, okay. But then stuff happens, you know, new managers comes in, you know, managers of different tactics. They might not like younger players coming through you know right. stuff like that you know but everything happens for a reason you know and and you know i love my time at norwich there and i still have a lot of time for the club yeah so yeah. there's so, a lot of hard work obviously that goes in to what you've done i think like that's really evident from what you've just said there like when you started to realize the sort of traction you were getting in that cup like all eyes went on to it hard work out muscled chelsea but there is an element of luck as well isn't there in furthering your career as well like you've just gone on to say about managers coming in and people then going through it's like what they like and what they want you may be signed one minute I guess because you're the right fit for that strategy but does it worry you that that strategy can always change in an instant um yeah I know what you mean there I mean it, it worried me it would have worried me like when I was younger um, yeah you know, when you're talking about contracts for managers and then one manager comes in and that's it you're out the window sort of thing but yeah yeah now as I'm older and wiser, you know, you know I can sort of deal with it a bit better. I'm thankfully I've been here at Sligo, you know, for four years now. Yeah. Um. So I haven't had to worry about that for a long time. But uh, 
yeah, you know, football is definitely very cutthroat and you have to be mentally strong to deal with it. And, um, you know, at Norwich, we had psychologists in all the time, you know, okay. talking about stuff like that and, and working on your game and, you know, working on your confidence on and off the pitch and stuff like that. So, yeah, that, that definitely helped as well when you're, when you're almost told that's it, like you're not getting a contract, it's up to you to wherever you go next sort of thing. Yeah. I just want to kind of refresh um, Norwich fans who are listening to this, their their memories on this. We, You know, we'd had our second season, we'd finished our second season in the Premier League. We were then at that point where we had Chris Hewton as the manager. And during that summer was when we tried to then sign a lot of players to try and take us on to the next level. So we were signing people like Javier Garrido, Redmond came in, Martin Olsen came in, Leroy Furr. Obviously, then the famous Ricky Van Walswinkle came in. <laughs> we, we tried. We tried to then. We tried to elevate our club to the next level, and we tried to establish ourselves as a Premier League side. Yeah. So, as a youth team player, after you've just had that successful season, you're seeing these kind of signings coming in. You, you mentioned about having the individual chat. Was there was there any options to be able to go out on loan? Did you see that as? as something as a viable option or was that, you know, did you, did you want to kind of knuckle down and see what you could do during that season at the club? Yeah. I mean, you know, once you're at the club before any talks about loan, you know, comes around, you're just, you know, working as hard as you can at the club, you know, trying to catch the eye of anyone at all, doing the best kind of games. But, um, you know, I remember, I think it was the year before I might've got, I might have got released. I think Carlisle came in to take me on loan. Well, they right. spoke to my agent at the time, and I remember thinking, like, before training, you know, oh, happy days, you know, go out and get some league football and league two, get yeah. a few games on my belt. And then that day in training, I remember going into a tackle or something stupid like that there, and a twig ligament to my knee. Oh. So that's got typical, you know. So it was only out for about two or three weeks, but then. You know, my agent then went on to Carlisle and he's like saying, look, they need someone like now. So, right. Yeah, kind of out the window. So, but look, you know, it's just it's luck sometimes. Um, and just at that time, luck wasn't on my side. But pick yourself up and go again, don't you? No point sulking about it. Yeah, <laughs> no, no, definitely. I'm just going to cure You know, we, we've had a number of people on who have said that, you know, they were they were very keen to go out and get first team football like at any sort of opportunity so it's just really to kind of get your thoughts on where you you know where you were at um sort of back then but the the club had a very difficult season um we ended up getting relegated that that particular season yeah. but um you know Neil Adams came in as as manager at that point did you then think I here's somebody who knows me he's managed me yeah knows my game during that summer, um, I believe that you actually you you made a couple of appearances and you actually yeah. played the League Cup, didn't you, against Crawley? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, um, yeah. When Neil got the gig, you know, I think there was a buzz around all the young all the young players, um, you know, because he he had us for two years and brought us to you won the youth, youth cup with us, like, mm. so he knew us inside out better than anyone. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think it was. Uh, we played Nice in a, in a friendly, yeah, Carroll, I think, and then I, he chucked me on the second half for about 20, 25 minutes, and uh, I remember I was a bag of nerves. I had no clue what was going on. <laughs> I remember him turning around to the bench, and I was almost trying to hide. They said, like, "Don't pick me," like, um, <laughs> but then no, I was glad he threw me in because, and um, because you know I got a, I got a taste for it then, you know, yeah, um, playing with even though it wasn't like twenty minutes, you know, playing with. I think Russell Martin might have been playing right back, or yeah, Russell Martin was right back, and I think Ryan Bennett was was left centre back beside me. Right. So you know, playing with players like that, there was bring you on leaps and bounds. But then yeah. I remember then the weeks the weeks after that, you know, I was up training with the first team a few times. Um, you know, getting getting used to the pace and all. You know, it's because it's a massive jump from the twenty ones to the first team. The pace is a joke. Of course. So and then. I think it was a cup game then against Crawley. Uh, yeah. Mark Robin, Mark Robson was Neil Adams' assistant at the time. Mm. And uh, I had a good relationship with Mark, a very good relationship. He was the 21s manager at one point as well. So that's another reason when Neil got the gig that Mark was his assistant. And then, you know, you get the bit between your teeth in that you think, right, these people know me. So you yeah. work even harder almost. And then yeah. he pulled me in the office and he started showing me clips of... Uh, 
the Crawley striker. I think it was McLeod, McLeod or whatever his name was, a striker. It's either Eyes or McLeod or that's him. McLean. That's it's, him, um, yeah. yeah. So he pulled yeah. me in the office anyway and he's put up this big like, white screen and he's showing me all these clips. <laughs> and I'm sitting here watching this and and before I leave the office, I remember him saying to me, going, um, uh, you know, I'm just showing you these. And he was like, look, you might not be starting at all. And I'm thinking, Jesus, surely I'm starting now if I'm after watching half an hour clips of the striker. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah, so started and played the full 90. Yeah. And uh, we won, I think we won 2-1 or something like that. Yeah, we did. Yeah, 3-1, I think it was. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. yeah. And I remember playing as well. The two twins were on the wings. Yeah. Josh and Jacob were on the wings. And... I don't know if any of the other lads. I think Reese Hall Johnson might have come off the bench. Yeah. And I remember thinking like that, you know, it's just mad what a, what a change a manager does. You know, the young boys get a chance. But saying that, Josh and Jacob were flying anyway after the Youth Cup. I think they got a sniff of the first team straight away. Yeah, they did, yeah. They were, they were a joke during that Youth Cup. But um, to see like Reese come off the bench and all, you know, it's mad what a change a manager can do, especially when they work for the young players. Yeah. But, um, uh, yeah. No, it was, it was brilliant. Neil, Neil was Neil's top class. And then during the course of that season, um, Neil uh, Neil Adams actually started off that season quite well. I think people forget yeah. that um, he he's the the campaign started off quite well, but more towards kind of November sort of time, it it started to slip and ever so slightly, and we were kind of dropping out of the playoffs. And obviously, he made the decision, which he said at the time was for the good of the club for him to, to step down. Alex Neal comes in as manager. Mm-hmm. The second half of the season was, it was all about getting promoted. The whole club was just promotion, promotion, promotion. We have to get promoted for the sake of finances of the whole club. It was yeah. all kind of systems go. Obviously, we have the day at Wembley, the best day of my life, other than <laughs> obviously day of, uh, day of my son being born and obviously the wedding day. Oh, just in case of the missus kind of... Ch- uh, has a go at me for saying that. <laughs> but simply, yeah, best day of my life that day. But from you, you you, you were then released at the end of that season. Yeah. Um, the conversation, was that was that done by Alex or was that done by somebody else at the club? And kind of talk me through your feelings and emotions at the time. Did you did you expect it? Or were you, were you really disappointed and wanted a, another chance to kind of prove what you could do? Yeah, sure. That was a strange one because actually, like, when Neil, when the club were doing well, like after I made that appearance for the first team, you know, I was in, I was in a lot of the squads. Like I was traveling to away games and coming to home games. You know, I was, I was in the whatever thirty man squad it was. Yeah. So like I was going to a lot of the games, and um, I remember then like reading the news one morning or something like that. So there's someone putting the text in the group chat saying Neil Adams has left Norwich or resigned or whatever. And I remember thinking, oh Jesus, who's going to come in now? Like. <laughs> so I seen Alex Neil come in and um, like he he just how how many games did he have? Did he have like half a season or something? Or I think he joined maybe the beginning of January. I can't remember. His, I know his first game was against Bournemouth, and we went right. down to ten men, and we we somehow managed to win that game. I'm just going to try and find it if I can. Yeah, but yeah he um I think he had just under half a season. That's right. Yeah. So there was so yeah, it was doing well under Neil. Like it was playing whatever. Doing playing well for twenty threes, you know, was in around the first team, um, and then I seen that he got sacked, and I thought, right, who's coming in? Seen Alex Neil come in, didn't know anything about him. Um, <laughs> no one did. <laughs> no, no one nothing did. about him. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, he just kind of he didn't really say much to the young boys, you know. Not a lot of us got up training with him then when he came in. Right. <clears throat> so um, you know, we were kind of left in limbo, didn't real, really know whether it was coming or going, you know. I'd, this was coming to the end of my contract, and then yeah. Alex and Ricky Martin pulled me into the office just to tell me about the contract and like what what they said was really like we need players who's going to get us promoted, like you know almost like experienced heads to get us back up to the Premier League. Yeah, so they said, look, we're going to have to we're going to have to let you go. But Alex Neil said, look, Hamilton wants you. You know, I'm going to send you up to Hamilton if you want to go up there and check the place out and stuff. So. That sorry, was, was this was this a permanent? Sorry, at the end of your contract that Hamilton wanted you. Sorry, or I'm not really sure if it, if it was, well, I hadn't agreed nothing, and like my agent hadn't agreed nothing. You know, they just sent me up there for a few days to have a look around the place. You know, to play yeah. a match or whatever, and then talks would start. So, yeah, but then as I was leaving Hamilton, uh, Orlando got on the phone. and I said, "Book me the next flight." <laughs> what? How? 
like, I read about this and I, I saw the move to Orlando. How does that come about? Like, how does a club like Orlando find out about somebody, about some a, a player being released by Norwich? That, that, from my mind, I'm just like, what the hell? <laughs> so, so, uh, me through that. Yeah, this was uh, strange, not really strange, but anyway, there was a guy who played with, uh, he was in the youth cup panel actually, his name's Harrison Heath. Um, yeah. His dad's Adrian Heath. He played for Everton, and and um, his dad was the gaffer of Orlando City at the time. And um, Orlando City were setting up like a a B team, um, like almost a reserve team. And the manager of that team was Ant Pulis, uh, Tony Pulis' son. Yeah, so yeah. When Harrison left um, Norwich, he he got let go after his second year scholarship. He went back to Orlando, so he signed, signed for Orlando anyway, and I had another two years here at Norwich. So anyway, got, I got released, went to Hamilton, you know, got talking there, whatever, get in touch in a few days, and just as I'm leaving Hamilton, um, my agent rang, because prior to that, I've been speaking to Harrison about Orlando, and right. he was quite close with Ant Pulis, and, you know, he was asking, Ant was asking him about me and how I played and blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. So he kind of got the ball rolling for me. Harrison did. Anyway, uh, Maiden gets in touch. Said, "Look, Orlando have offered you a deal. I'm going to email it over to you. Have a look. See what you think." And I remember getting the email through. I was in my missus, my mother-in-law's kitchen, um, getting the email. My missus came back from work, and I remember saying to Ella, "Like uh, Ella's my missus." Remember saying, "You know, what do you reckon? A few years in Orlando or not?" And she's like, "What are you on about?" So I showed her the deal, and she was buzzing. Obviously, Disneyland, <laughs> whatever, Universal. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that's how that came about. You know, it was just kind of, you know, Harrison put my name forward to Aunt Pulis. Um, Aunt rang me, got in touch with my agent. You know, and then it, it happened all pretty fast. Mm. So um, I think I went out. They flew me out within a few days, and I caught the last two months of the MLS season. Right. Then I came home, had a month off, and then I was back out. And I remember remember my first day out there trying to train in that heat. It was oh, one of imagine. the worst worst things I've ever experienced in my life. The young guy was let out in 40 degrees heat. <laughs> didn't know whether it was coming or going. <laughs> yeah. So, like, again, from that perspective, I'm guessing you've got to then sort out things like work visas and all that kind of stuff like that to, to go over to the U S and actually play, play there again. Does the club kind of figure that out? Have they got a liaison officer who kind yeah. of fizzles all of that kind of stuff out? Cause it's a new club. So I would imagine, or, or a new yeah. team rather the B team was, it was established that summer, wasn't it? So yeah. I'm guessing they've got someone who organizes that for you. Yeah. They had someone there who done, who done everything, you know, they had, the I came over the last two months of the MLS season. I went over like just to get used to the place and all, sign my deal, and you know yeah. get to meet everyone. Um, I was on like a um, a holiday visa. Yeah. So, like, uh, when if I ever got stopped and then you guys to Orlando, you know, I was getting chucked out of the country, sort of thing. <laughs> but uh, I got everything sorted over there within the two months. You know, I managed to get my apartment sorted. You know, and then the club got my working visa mm. sorted, and then. They managed to get my missus a visa on top of that, so it was ideal. You know, they looked after me really well. So, was yeah. that important to get, you know, for for her to come over with you? Would you not have gone if 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 she wasn't able to come? Yeah, well, I definitely wanted to bring her over. You know, we we lived together for three years before that, so right couldn't have just packed up because the the deal over there was three a three year deal. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. So oh. yeah, and um, I wouldn't think she had um appreciate being left. In England and me out enjoying the sunny weather in, in Orlando. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she had a pain of her life sitting with the pool every day. <laughs> <laughs> was, was it like, obviously very, very different. Did you find yourself adapting quickly or was it a bit odd? Um, What, like weather-wise or? Just, just every, it's a completely different way of life, yeah. I guess, isn't it? Like, yeah, it is. Was I it mean, a bit too different? I mean, the lifestyle was was incredible like don't get me wrong we would um we'd be in training early maybe on the pitch by nine because once it hit 12 o'clock or one o'clock you couldn't train in that heat no yeah it was it was a joke so you're home by 12 half 12 and then you're you know we didn't have any kids at the time so you're straight to the pool you know you're you're 
buying a few burgers at the shop and you're whacking open the barbecue and you're, you're having the time of your life. <laughs> mm. You know, maybe too good of a time out there, you know, because there was a lot of young lads in our B team. Yeah. So, you know, might have got carried away at times, you know, but, um, you know, it's an experience and uh, you yeah, have two kids and I'm back in Ireland. <laughs> so, I mean, no, no I'm, I'm, I'm a Miami Dolphins fan. Um, yeah. So I, I know all about the, the kind of training sessions and the way they have to work around that heat. And sometimes when they're in pre-season, they actually purposely put it on at yeah. midday because that's the most intensity that they're ever going to get from from their players. So I can imagine it would have been a hell of an experience. What what did you find about the um, the kind of standard of of the league that you were that you were competing in, especially from a sort of like a B team perspective? Yeah. To begin with? Um, I mean. Obviously, it was the first year of this B team. Mm. Um, I mean, it was a bit, a bit raw. Say there wasn't many technical players um, around around the league. Um, it was it was a lot different to European football. Yeah, um, a lot faster. Like, but no, that's that's probably wrong. I wouldn't say the football was a lot faster. The players were definitely a lot faster and stronger. But as I said, not very technical. Okay. So. Um, very raw, but I know now. I speak. I spoke to one lad who's just signed for us there at Sligo. Alex Cooper was playing out there last year, and he said he was out there for a few years, and he knows what I mean. He said that it's drastically improved. Like they're they're managing to get players in from Europe now. Yeah, the standards picked up lots. But I remember when I was there, like um, the the technical side of the game wasn't wasn't great. But our manager uh, and Pulis at the time was an absolute like tactician. Okay, like, he'd. He knew his way around around the pitch, like tactical wise. So we never ever struggled in that department. But uh, maybe other departments we did. <laughs> yeah. Do you think other teams struggled tactically at that stage? Uh, like, yeah. Thinking I think about so. the broader spectrum of what football was available. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think. But now, obviously, it's been I think four years since I've been out there. Like, so I'm sure it's improved by then. And yeah, yeah. To, speaking to Alex, who just came back from there, he said it's definitely improved. So, but yeah, I think the football's getting bigger and bigger out there anyway you know so yeah. the players are getting and even in the MLS the, the league's mad the players they get in there so you mentioned um the <clears> best <throat> player you trained with obviously was Kaka when he had his time over there yeah what did the B team and the and the main team kind of mix in training a lot um was that kind of essential to kind of getting you up to a to a certain standard or was that just kind of as and when they needed players to kind of dip into the first team uh, yeah, I mean, a few of a few of the boys would train like with them all the time, and then they'd come back, and then you know, between them with the B team, if we had a game on a Saturday, say you'd be down with the B team Thursday, Friday. Mm. Um, if yeah, if the first team needed bodies, you might have get called up. Um, sometimes you do sessions together. You know, we train at the same place, like so. If you ever needed someone, the, the first team Gaffer just whistle over and over you go, sort of thing. Mm. A bit similar to when I was at Norwich, like um, if you're under twenty three and he wants you over. Yeah, like someone to just whistle you over and over you go, sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but yeah, that's you know you had your you had your time in there, and um, yeah, it was it was good. It was a good experience, definitely, definitely a good experience. Definitely, and you you obviously you weren't over there for a a massive amount of time. Um, I think you were what just over a year. Yeah, over at Orlando. Why you, when you say you signed a three year contract, why did it finish after a year? If you don't mind me asking. Uh, no, that's fine. Um. So, yeah, over there for a year, a three-year deal. Um, and then my missus fell pregnant over there. Oh, okay. So we were looking into, like, having the baby over there and all that there. But, like, the financial side of having a baby in America is just an absolute joke. Because, like, we're obviously not American. So when the baby's yeah. born, you have to get a green card, which is about $12,000 or something crazy like that there. Oh, and then, and then, so yeah, and then top of that, there, like, you have to pay for like hospital bills and all that, there, and like, that's oh, just crazy. So, I just so I having just, all them afternoons off in the sun got expensive in the end. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <for> right. <laughs> You're dead right there, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I had to speak with my agent, um, you know, explain to him, and then I spoke to he spoke to a club back here. And yeah, I'm here now. The last four years, so that's how that came about. Yeah. So, so did or so Orlando didn't didn't release you then? You were actually signed by 
Saigo. That was that was that was how it was done. Or did the, did Orlando kind of just mutually say, look, you know, this is your current situation. We understand that. We're gonna re- we're gonna release you because that's the only part I couldn't think. Uh, that's the only part yeah. with my research that I couldn't find out how you went from Orlando to to Saigo. Yeah, I was just kind of locked. They, they knew where I was coming from, so they said, look, we'll, we'll just let you go then. Right. Like, I didn't go in kicking up a fuss and look, I went all the rest of my money. I just kind of wanted to, to take it home sort of yes. thing. Um, yes. So we came home. Yeah, I got the deal done with Sligo literally within hours. Um, right. After uh, cancelling my deal at Orlando. Um, and, yeah. Is that because you knew people there or you were already on their radar as such? At Sligo? Yeah. Um, yeah, I knew... Well, the assistant manager there at the time, he was he was with me all the way through with the Irish underage setups. Right. Okay. So he knew what kind of player I was or whatever. So, and I knew a couple of players there. Uh, I spoke to one guy. His name's Kieran Sadler. He's at Doncaster now. Um, yep. He, I spoke to him and I said, you know, what's it like there? Whatever. I said, and he, they were like, look, we're actually looking for a centre back. So right. within minutes, the assistant manager rang me and said, look, we'll get a deal over. Blah blah blah. Then the gaffer rang me, and the deal was over and agreed within an hour or two. Okay, so was um you know when you when you were making a decision to either come back to 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 Ireland or 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 the UK, when you when you're having a discussion with 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 your other half, is there is there much of a compromise? Is, is she saying I want to be in England because obviously if, if you met her in Norwich or or was Ireland always going to be the main choice? Or no, was it just a case of whoever whoever took an interest, whoever yeah. wanted to sign you? Yeah, I think um, like after leaving Orlando, like we were thinking, she was kind of thinking, like, look, what are we going to do now? You've got no club. I was like, look, just stay away. Leave me alone for a few hours. I get it sorted, sort of thing. Right. And um, <laughs> so I got it sorted, anyway, and I said, look, this is what's been offered. This is where we're going to live. You know, it's two hours away from my family. It's an hour flight away from your family. Like, it uh, would be all bad. So, you know, the deal was good. You know, my family's only up the road. I think she was just more concerned about, she wanted to be near people for when the when my, my when my son was born. Mm. Um, and obviously I did as well. So knowing that my family was just two hours up the road and then her mum and her sister was a flight away, you know, it was ideal. Because we've got an airport that flies into Stansted, which is 10 minutes from my house. So oh, wow. it's perfect. Um, but she actually ended up, we she had the baby in Norwich, which was perfect for her. Yeah. So um yeah, she had the baby there and my gaffer at the time, uh Jared Little, he gave me a, a full week off to go over when she had the baby, so it was perfect. And uh, obviously then you, you mentioned obviously then the move to to Sligo's happened. Kind of just talk me through your your your, your time there. How how have you found the league, the club? What what was it been like, and do you f- do you feel kind of settled there? Yeah, oh yeah, definitely settled. You know, been here four years. The clubs, the clubs, brilliant. Um, yeah, my first year, I had a, had a great year. I got player of the season. Um, brilliant year. You know, the the league here is a lot is very underestimated by a lot of people. I think outside the league of Ireland. Yeah. Um. You know, and I hold my hands up. I said in a lot of interviews before that, before I signed here, I was thinking, oh, you know, do I want to go back there? And I'm glad yeah. I did now because it's such, such a good league. You know, there's, I was a bit naive because there's two European spots up for grabs here, three European spots up for grabs. Mm. You know, if you do well in the season, you're, you're playing Europa League. Right. Um, so, yeah, it's a big, it's a good league. It's very physical. You know, that's probably another reason why I enjoy it, you know, so, bumps and bruises and kicks and that there's that's kind of how I try to play I suppose <laughs> yeah I suppose that's kind of that's suited to your game that was what you yeah that's what you were yeah as you mentioned right at the beginning of the podcast that was what you were known as you know that was one of your strengths wasn't it yeah that's what I remember my Paul Lambert actually going back to it now when we had a friend I think I, I remember who it was against we were against faking him we had a pre-season friendly for the under 18s and Paul Lambert took it and after the game, I remember he pulled me aside and he said to me, um, you know, you'll make a living out of the game if you keep tackling like that there. So, I have to stop, <laughs> <sense."> <laughs> So, Brilliant. yeah, that was, was good to hear from him. Um, so, yeah, I just haven't stopped kicking boys since. So, <laughs> until I get told otherwise, I'll stop. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, the, the three seasons you've been, um, been at, at, at Sligo, obviously now that you're coming into your fourth, 
fourth season, I believe. Um, you, you, the club have always been there or thereabouts in terms of just about avoiding um, about avoiding relegation. Um, yeah. You know, from your perspective, um, how, how much of a challenge ha- has that been? You know, I, I suppose this is probably like your real first competitive team that you've been at how, how, how have you adjusted over the years to being in that in, in that in type of environment yeah it's enjoyable I, I actually enjoy it because I like the pressure's good you know the the, the games have a bit more bite bite to it um, mm. on a Saturday yeah. whereas in Norwich maybe under 23s or under 21s 18s it's all about development you know yeah like we're going to play this way you have to play this way whatever and then Orlando was kind of just Kind of similar, almost, you know, new league, new team. We're going to play like yeah. this. But here on a Saturday, like, boys are going out to fight. Boys are going out to, you know, win, to, to pay a mortgage, you know, to put food mm-hmm. on the table, yeah. to do this, that, the other. So, do you know that, you're the second person that's in the pro game, pro game yeah. that we've had that said that? Yeah. That there's so much difference when you make that step up from the sort of under-23s to the senior football because yeah. the win really matters. Not only from a competitive edge but it, it provides a financial Definitely, reward yeah. and stuff and that that gives people something in itself that's it yeah you, you've got that extra bite and um you know as i said you're, you're paying you're playing to pay mortgages and stuff like that there whereas in the 23s you know if you lose a game you think oh we'll be in training happy days monday morning we go again lovely training ground whatever but um yeah we've been around relegation and um maybe the the squads we have, we shouldn't be. I mean, some of the players we have are are exceptional. You know, we we do we have made a few changes this year. Um, brought in a few players from different countries. Um, it was it was it's frustrating because just before the break, we were just starting to click. You know, we were really having a go with teams, and then the break just happened. Yeah. But, um, but saying that it could it could have been a it could be a blessing in disguise because we actually had six six players out injured. Right. <laughs> yeah, and um, six and four of them were defenders. Oh wow! So I was the only, I was only recognised defender playing on one point. So, so yeah, it was a bit of a makeshift team to be honest. But uh, I suppose for you, like partnerships and stuff like that, getting used to knowing who you're yeah, playing with, that must it. have been an absolute nightmare. Yeah, and especially you know the the two boy, the one of the boys who came back and the play beside me at centre back was a midfielder. You know, it's a completely different role for him. Um, <laughs> you know, I understand where he's come from because last year I was playing holding midfield and I hadn't a clue what was going on in there half the time. Right. So, but I was literally, the gaffer actually said to me, is that you're, you're just put in there to break boys up and break up play. So, do what you're good at. <laughs> right. Fair yeah. enough. Yeah. So, did you enjoy uh, playing in that role? I did, yeah. I actually did enjoy it a lot. A lot more than I thought I would. Um, you know, obviously getting on the ball in the half turn wouldn't be one of my biggest strengths as a centre back yeah. but um, you know getting involved you know winning it back I enjoyed winning it back you know getting stuck in when your headers you know and just keeping it simple really just oh, I love I love playing on football manager with a holding midfielder yeah yeah stick an anchor man in <laughs> no, absolutely you gotta, love you gotta, it if you're gonna if you're gonna have somebody in a holding role it's gotta be the deep line playmaker you gotta have somebody who can pick the ball up and spray it about I stick, I stick them in the centre of the park, James. No, no. That's where you're missing a trick, mate. You're no, missing um, a trick. You really are. Kevin De Bruyne. <laughs> well, I him, yeah, I, I just stick him or Pogba doing it right in the middle of the park. Yeah, well, going back to your um, your, your time in Ireland, when, when, were you made, um, when were you made captain? I was oh. made captain my um, second year. Um, wow. So... My first year here, our manager, Dave Robertson at the time, he yeah. got sacked, I think, six months, maybe into the season. Mm-hmm. And then Jared Little came in from Cliftonville, Northern Ireland. Yeah. Brilliant manager. Brilliant guy, you know, top man. And um, he actually, he made me captain then halfway through that first season. Right. Wow. Um, and then I just continued it on um, ever since. So, yeah. So, you were, I'm guessing you were 20. Two, maybe twenty three at the time. I was I was twenty one at the time when I signed for first time for Sligo, yeah. No, sorry, sorry, when you were made captain, sorry. Oh sorry, I was I was twenty one when I was first made captain, yeah, when I was officially right. announced as captain. Okay. What yeah. You know, we, we I mentioned this to um 
to Joe Jacobson when I had a conversation with him about how important is the captaincy within a club that, you know, and he said he, he still believes it's vitally important to have that leader as someone that you can kind of go to as you're, as you kind of go to at that age, what, you know, the responsibility you've just got into the team. Um, talk me through that moment when, when they, when they said that you were going to be the captain, what were you thinking? Yeah, I was buzzing at the time. You know, I couldn't wait to tell like my missus or my family or whatever. Yeah. But, um, you know, I know there's all different types of types of captains and that there. Um, you know, I'd have my fair share in the sh- fair uh, say in the change room, stuff like that there. You know, but um, I'm lucky that I've got three or four like older players in the team who've been in the league a lot longer than me. Right. Who would have more experience than me that, and they would have a better say than me in the change room sort of thing. Okay. I was doing maybe I would maybe do more of my talking on the pitch like. You know, maybe set an example by maybe like winning the first header or you know making the first tackle or something like that. There, yeah, yeah. Tackle sort of thing. Um, okay. but you know, I could, you know, me and the gaffer have a great relationship. You know, when Jerry Little was there, me and him had a great relationship. You know, we we he'd pull me aside, talk about players, talk about how the mood is, and the same now with our gaffer Liam Buckley. You know, he would pull me aside and say like, "How's the lads feeling? How's this? How's that?" But you know, he would pull three or four of us aside because, as I said, there's three or four boys in there as well who's a lot more experienced than me and, and they've also got a big say. So, it's, yeah, it's there's, also, there's one captain who wears the armband, but, you know, there's still a lot of boys in that team that you can look up to. Yeah, I just, I, I find it fascinating that at that age that you were that you were made captain, you must have had something about you, as you said, quite rightly say, in the changing room to, to be given that responsibility because you tend to see it towards maybe players who were like maybe in their late twenties, early you know early thirties who are kind of reaching that peak of their career where they've been there, done it, got the t-shirt, so to speak. But for you to get it at such a young age, that just shows from your perspective what you know your presence in the change room, I guess. Yeah, yeah, you know I like to think I have a decent presence, you know, in the change room. Um, you know, I get on with all the lads, you know that. I'm I'm lucky because in our change room there's no dickheads, you know. <laughs> it's a bit different if you've had, you know, a few clowns in there who thinks they're they're bigger than what they are. Yeah. Because you know the, the lads in our teams they wouldn't be long bringing them back down to earth. Right. Um, but yeah, I, I've had a bit of an easy ride in the change rooms as such because all the lads have been top class. Right. So um, I'll give you a call back if I ever stumble across uh, <laughs> a hard one. Fucking <laughs> <laughs> yeah. stuff. So. From a, from a club perspective this season, obviously I know you know we, we've we've talked about what's happened so far, but for the club long term, have you got many kind of ambitions as a club? Um, what what kind of things are said? Um, you know, is there like a five year plan in place of where they want to see themselves? Is it just about kind of establishing yourselves in, you know, continuing to just not be in that relegation yeah. conversation? I think that's the main one. Yeah, we we need to we need to start climbing away from the lower half of the table. Um yeah. you know, the last few years just you know, league position hasn't been good enough. Uh right. And you know, I speak for all the lads. Um because the quality we have in the change room we should be we should be up there like thereabouts, you know, battling for Europe. Yeah. So yeah, that's what that's what we want to do. We want to climb away from the relegations and you want to be putting pressure on Europe and, and last year we got to the semi final of the FA Cup FAA Cup, which was massive for the club. Yeah, and we sold out the stadium. I think there's about five, six thousand there. Um, sold it out. You know, we we got we got robbed. You know, don't want to say too much about referees, but but there you go. <laughs> uh, it is what it is. I wouldn't be I wouldn't be the most liked anyone in the league by the referees, so I don't want to say. <laughs> right, fair enough. <laughs> Absolutely fair enough. Um, you know, and from I suppose from your perspective, before we kind of go into the Twitter. Um, the Twitter and Facebook questions that we got sent in for you. Um, what are your kind of goals? And I know you may not want to say too much, you know, but in terms of where do you, I suppose, do you see yourself kind of in five years' time? Because you've had those, un, you know, you've had those under 21s, under 19s, under 18s caps. How, how difficult is it to kind of break into the first team maybe of the national setup you know and um what kind of ambitions have you got personally do you want to be what you know what, what what do you see yourself doing in five years you know yeah you know look you want to you want to be playing at the highest level as possible um right. you know obviously the league of ireland isn't no premiership um 
in in England. But um, look, I just want to be, as I said, playing highest highest levels possible. Um, whether that be here in Ireland, England, you know, um, yeah. five years from now. Oh, uh, I'd say the missus want a few more kids anyway. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, you know, I have a happy, healthy family. You know, hopefully, yeah. I'm sure, I'm, I'm hopefully we'll be at the other end of this pandemic in anyway, five years' time. Yeah. If not, something badly wrong. But yeah, just, you know, highest levels possible. Still enjoy my football, still the love for the game. And uh, yeah, it'd be, it'd be, obviously it's lovely to get, it'd be lovely to get noticed by the national team. But the players that they have in a centre back there, playing Premier League every week, is probably be a bit difficult at the minute. Do, do you um, do, do you find that the national team managers do they do they come and watch Irish games a, a huge amount? Because it's very rare whenever you see the team announced that you ever. It's very rare that you find anybody from the national, you know, from the league. In, yeah. In, so it's competitions. That must is it is it a source of frustration or do the players just kind of accept that 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 is just kind of the way it is really? I think I think we've accepted it to be honest. You know, um, right. there's one player who's been unbelievable in the league uh, last season and this season. Jack Byrne, he's playing with Shamrock Rovers. Right. Um, he's been in the round Irish setup, but he he's he's a top player. Like, is um, he a right back? Sorry, is he a right back? No, he's um. He's a midfielder, but like he, he could end up at right back anywhere. He's a sort of midfielder, just you know, trots around the place and gets on the ball anywhere. Oh, I've just no, I've just I've had somebody, Jack Byrne, who plays for me for uh, for my football manager, say but he's from <laughs> Ireland. I just, I, don't know, I just I just put two and two together. I just thought it must be the same player, but it's clearly not. It's clearly not. But no, I oh, think that, like, you know you accept it, and you know that there's a lot of Irish players playing in the Premier League Championship, and you know they'll probably get the nod over us boys here in Ireland, but. Yeah, you know, you know, it's just good to see the national team do well as well. And the manager in there now um, is uh, actually a former Dundalk manager. He yeah. managed him two years ago, I think it might have been. So yeah, he's in there now. He's the gaffer to set up. So there might be more A's in this league. You never know. Well, if there is anybody who's going to give you know give guys in that league a chance, it probably is going to be him. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Not being funny, Mick McCarthy's knowledge of the Irish league. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to. You know. <laughs> I'll say whatever, but he's not going to know the league inside out, considering no. how long he's been in the English game for. Do you know yeah. what I, you know what I mean? So, and I don't think I don't think many English managers would either. So, it's good that it's good that Stephen Kenny's got the FAA gig, and, and hopefully it attracts more interest to, to us boys over this league. Fantastic, yeah. Adam, any questions that you've got you want to add on top before we go on to the Twitter and Facebook stuff? No, no, I mean, like one of the things I wanted to touch on is like international football and stuff, and I think we've done that. And um, like you're only 25, card, like you've had quite a varied career already. It's been yeah. quite fascinating, really. Like <laughs> moving different countries for each of your clubs, as such. Like you know, going through like yeah. you know, had a decent spell in in three different countries, and like even like coming up through the ranks, and it's your dad that was coaching you to start with and stuff like that. It's, there's an interesting story behind what you've what's happened with yourself, and like in terms, of the only thing I'd sort of say, like future wise, like like Irish football is that something that's growing and getting bigger and bigger? Because I think football as a game at the moment definitely seems to be accelerating a bit. Like I don't know if it's social media that's pushing a bit of prominence with it. Mm-hmm. Um, is Irish football really growing at the moment as well, yeah. or? Yeah, big time. I mean, from when I first got here to now, it's it's, it's gotten far bigger. You know, um, yeah. Even the players that that some clubs have brought in, um, you know, social media does play a big part. Uh, you know, there's been a few absolute rockets of goals this year. And, yeah. Uh, you know, when some of that gets traction, you know, the league, the league then maybe picks up a bit more eyes. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, the league's definitely gotten bigger and far more professional. So. That's, that's good, you know. It's obviously on the up, so yeah, yeah. It, hopefully, it continues. What's the TV coverage like um, in terms of the in terms of like the top league, the Premier, the Premier League for Irish football? Is it is it is it go is it getting bigger over the years? It's slowly getting bigger. I mean, you might get we might get three games a year on the telly, right? So okay. It's slowly, slowly getting bigger. But there's no like there's no TV money or no TV contracts or nothing. Is it so, not? No, the clubs don't get money for that there. So, 
that's okay. that's something which probably should be done and should be talked about because then again it would help the league and the clubs as well. Well, yeah, you think about the more money that gets pumped into it, the big you know the bigger names you're then able to exactly, attract, yeah. the, the bigger the league can grow. It, it needs to be something that's done, really. That, that yeah. puts an interesting scale of balance, though, on the league and its reputation. Yeah. If it can't pull money from those sources, if the Premier League didn't have TV money, yeah. Do, do you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah <laughs> like, like it, it would be a whole different kettle of fish. Those players mm-hmm. wouldn't be playing in there because they sim- simply couldn't afford to pay them. Yeah. yeah. You so. Go- you go back to 1992 and you think if the money wasn't pumped into the... And then the Premier League wasn't made back then, where would English football be now? Yeah. It wouldn't yeah. be any better than the Italian leagues, the Spanish yeah. league, do you know what I mean? It wouldn't It wouldn't be nowhere near. Yeah. It's only because that level of investment came in that they were then able to attract some of the biggest and best names from all over the all over the world, do you know what I mean? Yeah. That's, one thing I am disappointed in is that when Wes left, I wanted him to go back over to Ireland. When Wes Houdan <laughs> left, I really wanted him to go back there, and he's gone to um, bloody Australia. Australia, yeah. I was disappointed. Yeah. I wanted him to go home. We could have done with him. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, we'll both track him down, shall we, Carl? We'll see what yeah. we can try and sort out. <laughs> you know, when you're bored of a son in Australia, come back home <laughs> and sort yourself out. Yeah. Try, I'll try and get him on for a then. podcast. <laughs> oh... Oh, that would be incredible. I don't think I'd be able to contain myself. He's my favourite player of all time. So what a player he was, yeah. Adam, you'd have to basically do the whole thing yourself, mate. I can, I can, I'd just be like, hi, Wes, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> I can't control myself. I can't control myself. Right, let's get into some Twitter questions and then we will wrap things up, Carl, because I appreciate no we've taken a lot of your time this evening. Um, we've got Drew Kendall, who has got, he's a massive um, follower of the channel. Cheers, Drew, for getting in contact. Uh, it says, you guys keep raising the bar every single time you're doing a great job. That's obviously for ourselves. Thank you very much, Drew. Appreciate that. Um, my question would be, is there much difference between the standard of football um, from Norwich to Orlando to Sligo? We've kind of covered that. And how how does it differ? Um, I suppose, what is the biggest difference between the three, the three levels of football? Um, um, would be his, that's his first question. Yeah. So, like I said before... Um... Norwich, when I was underage at Norwich, um, obviously it's developmental. Orlando, yeah. you know, it was the first, first like franchise B team set up. You know, nothing really in stamp at that time. But then at Sligo, you know, it's you play to win. Doesn't matter how you get the win, you have to win. Um, yeah. Maybe, maybe when you're at, um, maybe when you're in Norwich, like development, you can probably showcase your your skills a bit more, your technique a bit more. You know, teams are a lot more standoffish because it's the way teams want to set up and work on the way they play or whatever. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I mean, in, in Sligo now, you know, it's men's football, sort of do or die. So, yeah, that that's that's the real difference for me over here in Sligo is you have to win. Definitely. And his second question, he says, um, if he could pick one player that he's played with um, and play with you at your current club, <laughs> now I'm gonna I'm gonna exclude Kaka from this. Yeah, conversation. I, was say, I don't, yeah. don't want to hear that because we've already heard it. Who, who who would other than him from your time at you know Norwich and Orlando and you know who who would you pick? Who who would you love to have on your team right now? I'll go for a Norwich player this time. He's already done Orlando. I'd say I'd go for probably Wesel. Wesel. Yeah, Wes. Yeah, Wes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's got to be in it really. Yeah, Wesel. Absolute genius of a man. Cheers, Drew. Thanks for your question, mate. Uh, we've got Dave Campbell. I think you, you've obviously replied to this one, so you, you know what's coming. Um, he's uh, He said, <laughs> please ask Kyle what age he really is. In brackets, at least 30. And why his style slash look is based on a 1979 long cash chick. I don't know what that is. I haven't a um, either. <laughs> That's just them typical Dubliners, mouth and half. <laughs> <laughs> he's our uh, he's our like scout he's our like player scout so oh uh, okay so right. he doesn't do much to be honest <laughs> <laughs> just sits about fills some paper forms in yeah <laughs> shows his ID badge that's it <laughs> that's it brilliant stuff we've got uh, Gerard O'Connor he said um if Lee Grace from Shamrock makes a robust tackle and you do the same, will you be treated the same? You've got to fill me in on what he's talking about here. What does he mean? <laughs> what does so, he mean? Uh, 
the sham shams and uh, sham sham rovers and slag rovers. You know, it's a big rivalry. Yeah. Right. And, you know, sham rovers are a Dublin club. Yeah. yeah. One of many Dublin clubs. Um, but I know what Jared's getting at there. Uh, you know, referees maybe tend to tend to turn a bit of a blind eye to the bigger clubs. Ah, uh, okay, but, right. Uh, no so, question. But, uh, yeah, but I, I know Jared anyway, and uh, he knows the answer to that one. So <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> brilliant, brilliant <laughs> stuff. Um, let's see, we've got one. I've done I've those. Got one here. Do you want me to do? It? I've got one from Elliot Cutting. Yeah, um, go for it. Go for it. I'm going to find my Facebook ones. Go on. Then. Uh, quite an interesting one, actually. Um, he said, "Do you think the Irish FA could do more to promote the league itself and fund it um, compared to what's been done for the international side? The, the profile of the international side's obviously grown yeah. quite considerably. Um, so." I guess just to expand on Elliot's question, would more funding help help yeah, the national side too? Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, that there could be a lot, a lot more done with this league. You know, going back to the TV deals, like there's no TV deals in place, but they're happy enough to show a game sort of thing. Yeah. Um. But yeah, there could, there's a lot, there's a lot of room for improvement in this league. C- can with, I? Like, yeah. can I take that a bit further? Then? Like, with there not being TV money and stuff, what, what, loads of like young Irish players come over to England, loads of them. Mm-hmm. So, what's like the academy set up like with Irish clubs? Is that in place, or do they tend to just get picked from regional teams, very much in the sort of vein that you said, sort of playing at county level, yeah. and people get picked off there rather than academy type football? So, I think no. Um... It's the academy actually starts here now. It's thirteen under thirteen, I think. And right. um, I think until yeah, under nineteens, I think it is kind of all county and like regional stuff. Okay. So if you're within the county, like if you're one of the better players in that position in the county, you're gonna play for like example Sligo under nineteens. Yes. So but then when you get into the first team, that's when like the money gets involved and you can go sign them players here, offer them this, that, the other. So yeah. Yeah, the academy the academy setup I think is just like regionalized country or county based so yeah but yeah the f the fai could definitely do a lot more to promote the league and you know there's been numerous talks about it before but you know there's always been blind eyes turned it but hopefully now um hopefully now something does change after this year you know i think we've got enough time to think about it anyway but uh we'll soon see that question in particular interests me as an ipswich fan but i'm sure you're aware ipswich take quite a lot of Irish players. Yeah. Yeah. They and yeah, they're, they're, really... they're some are successful, some some not so much. Um but it is interesting to see and hear, you know, it, with a bit more investment, maybe that that could help grow the profile of the Irish league and those Definitely. could be held within the Irish league. Um so there's, there's been some good ones that have come over definitely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, all of they could definitely do more 100%. Um, I've got some Facebook questions. These are more centered around your time at Norwich and yeah. the, in particular the team that um, that that was there. So I've got um, memory you know, test coming up here. <laughs> no, that's no, it's not. It's, uh, <laughs> we've, got, we've got Chris Rose who starts off by saying, "Why do you think it was that only the Murphy twins really established themselves in the first team when clearly there was talent all over that youth team?" That's a question, James. That is a good question. Yeah. Because if you think about it, we had Harry Toffolo, who was never, ever given a chance in the first team. That that was always one that annoyed Norwich fans, like yeah. some from it. Cam McGeehan, who has gone on to have a brilliant career in the game and is only getting better. He, yeah. He's still a fantastic talent. What does Toffolo do now, James? I think he's, he's at Olympic. Huddersfield, don't he? Oh no! You, yeah, you are right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. yeah. Um, so I, can, I can remember him coming through, even as an Ipswich fan, being yeah, talented. Yeah. He's been a huge talent. Yeah, yeah he, was, he was a player. He, was, he still is a player. Like I speak to Toff most days. Yeah, we we still get on very well. Yeah. So and yeah, you know he's, we've he's done well. We had Colt, we, obviously Colton Morris is still on our books, but he's yeah. never been given a chance. He's still he's still going out on loan every season, and I don't know. I I I really want him to give, be given a go, but I can't see. Yeah, when when it's going to happen, you know, we had people like um, there was Harry Randall in that team. Do you know what That's I mean? Right. There, was a, Randall, there, yeah. there was a lot of talent that was never given a chance. Why? Why do you think it was only the Murphys that broke into it? What? What? What do? You, what would you kind of put it down to? I think you know, from an early age, I just think 
you the, the twins had that something special about them. Um, right. And you know, it just they probably took their chance more than any of us, uh, better than any of us. Sorry. Okay. Um, but yeah, um, they do you think like mentally as well as physically. Do you? Mean I'd that? say so. Yeah. 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 Okay. You know, the two boys, they're they're frightened. You've seen you've seen what they're like yourselves. Um, yes. What they've gone on to do. <laughs> so um, yeah, it's definitely yeah. worked out for them, and it's a it's a good question. It's a tough one to answer, but I think they may have just had that bit more at that time to to kick on. Yeah, it, it reminds me of that a question we asked Jamie Curtin when he was on, when he said that mm-hmm. about if his mentality was right when he was younger, he didn't know what he yeah. could go on to do. And then you see players that can be recognised as having that. Yeah, they're sometimes the ones that are picked out of their group. Yeah, and go a little bit further. That is really interesting. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, and then we've got um, we've got Sammy who asks, um, "What has been your career highlight to today, other than the Youth Cup, other than the Youth Cup win?" Um, probably being named captain at, at Slagger Rovers at such a young age. You know, yeah. uh, obviously, look, it's, it sounds bad, but I haven't on to won anything since that. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, being named named captain at twenty one of, of a big club in Ireland, you know. Um, yeah. And leading them for the last three and a half years, you know, it's been it's been good for me on a personal level. Um, yeah. So yeah, that that's been that's been a highlight of my career so far. Do you think that being captain of a club from an early age is far more than just something for your CV as such? It's actually developed you as a person in in ways that you wouldn't have been exposed to in football beforehand. Yeah, I'd say like if, if you know if I wasn't captain, I wouldn't speak up as much as I do. Right. Sort of thing, uh, in yeah. training or in change rooms or whatever. Um, but as I said, you know, before, I'm I'm glad in this team that it's not just me. There's there's three or four other boys who have as much to say as me. It's kind of just an armband at the end of the day when when the yeah, f- yeah. three or four of us get together. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it definitely does. It definitely does. Character builds you. Uh, almost makes you mentally stronger. Um, yeah. No, it's definitely helped me. Um develop and, and on and off the field as well because you take on duties off the field you know where it's be press conferences or appearances or speaks or stuff like that there so yeah, yeah no, it's as good as help me help me both on and off the pitch I, I picked up on that earlier when you said like you know there's a few other boys as well that take the lead as such yeah. as well and like in a squad that must be so important to not be the only person that's directing a bit do you know what I mean to, to know that you've got a, a spine of players that are all lifting yeah, definitely. Yeah, we've, got, we've got a, a youngish squad as well, so it does help that there's three or four of us there, kind of, yeah, yeah. kind of steering the ship almost. Yeah, brilliant stuff. Um, Kyle, absolute pleasure having you on the show. It's been amazing to hear about your, you know, your career to this point. And as Adam quite rightly said, 25 years old, you've got, I suppose, you know, the world at your feet. You've got so many options that you can continue to do. I, I'm. You've you've opened my eyes to be honest um, about the Irish league. I've all, I've known about it, and I've, I've yeah. as I said, I've done I've done the football manager stuff, and it's been you know it's been nice to 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 manage in that league from a virtual world point of view. But yeah. you've really opened my eyes about the standard of the you know of football over there. Yeah. Um, and I think Adam, what we need to do when all of this shit is over and done with, yeah, when we when we are out of this mess, we need to go over and watch Kyle in action. Go go for a road trip. That would be awesome. <laughs> I think we need to come over and I think we need to come over and watch a game. I really yeah, I do that. because I want to. I want to. I want to witness it for myself. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's brilliant. You know, the the fans over here are, are mental. You know, it's just yes, good atmosphere. And we'll get you. We'll get you a cruise light in the bud light as well if you want. <laughs> <laughs> we'll hold you to that one. <laughs> That's brilliant a reason stuff. to come over in itself. Yeah, brilliant stuff. No, but again, uh, thank you very much for coming on the show, Carl. Um, no problem, I really appreciate that. your time. Um, yeah, it just I say it to everyone: keep safe, look after your family, make sure every you know you know everyone's okay. And uh, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. No but problem. If you, guys, if you guys have enjoyed the video, make sure you, uh, from a YouTube perspective, you hit the thumbs up. Uh, leave a comment on your favorite part of the podcast and subscribe to the channel. If you're listening to this on any podcasting platform, leave us a five-star review and also subscribe as well. If you want to take that support one step further, 
you can donate money towards the channel either via Patreon or via Podbean. Links for all of those will be in the description of the video and on the YouTube channels as well. So thank you very much. Until next time, as, I, as always, adios. Mm-hmm.